Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those tuning in from around the world. This is Fenimore Art Museum's virtual symposium on Venice, where art, science, and activism meet. My name is Danielle Henrici, and I'm the Director of Education for Fenimore Art Museum in Cooperstown, New York. We are so thrilled that you are joining us for what promises to be a really fascinating, universally relevant discussion. Venice captures the imagination. History, art, romance, food, music, architecture, canals, gondolas, and gondoliers. It's almost an impossible place. So, of course, it has inspired artists for centuries. With Fenimore Art Museum's current exhibition, Unmasking Venice, American Artists and the City of Water, curated by Anne Cannon and Julia Medor, we explore and celebrate the intense relationship between artists and this singular subject. A partnership project with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, both the exhibition and associated programs, including this symposium, are made possible by Art Bridges. This meaningful collaboration has made a big impact. Since the exhibition's opening, we have welcomed thousands of visitors to learn and engage. But today, Venice is at risk. Increasing tourism disrupts and exploits local culture and infrastructure while ever rising sea levels due to climate change, threaten flood and decay. Now is a time for educating, protecting and preserving so that future generations can continue to find joy and inspiration in this unique, extraordinary city. The speakers who will join us over the next three hours are leading experts in their respective Venice-related fields, and we are very grateful that they have made time to be with us today to share what they know and, I expect, incite us all to action. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Please be mindful to stay muted with your video off so that all of our viewers may fully focus on the speakers. There will be a moderated discussion and question and answer session after all of the speakers have presented. Please post your questions to the chat as you have them. You do not have to wait until the end. To post your question, simply click the chat button in the middle of the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Thank you so much for joining us today. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator. A specialist in the art of Renaissance Venice, Frederick Ilchman is chair, Art of Europe, and the Baker Curator of Paintings at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. He holds an AB from Princeton University and a PhD from Columbia University. Frederick has curated or co-curated such exhibitions as Titian, Tintoretto, Veronese, Rivals in Renaissance Venice for the MFA and Musée du Louvre in 2009, Casanova's Europe for Kimball Art Museum, Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and the MFA in 2017 and 2018, and Tintoretto, painter of Renaissance Venice for Palazzo Ducale and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC in 2018. He also serves as the chairman of the board of Save Venice Incorporated, the largest private organization devoted to art conservation in Venice. Frederick, take it away. Thank you, Danielle. Buongiorno, benvenuti. Hi, I'm Frederick Elchman, and I'm, uh, as Danielle indicated, I wear two hats. I'm a museum curator, and I'm also um, very involved with this American organization, Save Venice, and one of our speakers, in fact, is from Save Venice today. Um, uh, first slide, please. So, we're here, of course, uh, because of this wonderful, splendid, small exhibition, Unmasking Venice, American Artists in the City of Water, on view right now at the Fenimore. Uh, and that's the starting point for this exhibition and an engagement of many broader ideas and specific challenges as well about this great city and what it uh, uh, can do to face the future. Um, next slide. As I mentioned a minute ago, I'm a museum curator and I've had the great pleasure and privilege of uh, working on uh, exhibitions of art related to Venice and had the 
joy of bringing Venetian paintings, among others objects, from all around the world, uh, but even from Venice itself, to put them on the walls of museum galleries or even on the ceiling, as you see here with this Tintoretto, back in 2009. Um, and next slide. But I want to speak very broadly, not about uh, my career, but about the city that means a lot to me and presumably to so many of you, and that's why you're watching this. Uh, and Venice is a very special place. It's gorgeous, fragile, romantic, as this uh, slide with the reflection in the puddle makes clear. Um, but also it can be timeless. Next. This is a Ken Little painting from 1738 uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Big picture view of the Bacino, the Bay of St. Mark's. Not much has changed in almost 300 years. And uh, that is itself so and so encouraging. Next. And just a little bit of background uh, that we have just a map of Italy here in the Mediterranean. Notice that Venice uh, in the upper right there, it's really the only uh, historically important major city on the east coast of Italy, right? All the other particularly well-known places like Genoa, Florence, uh, Rome, Naples are all on the west coast. So Venice was automatically automatically looking eastward, right? Towards the eastern Mediterranean, to Greece, towards Byzantium, uh, to the Middle East. Um, and that gave it an orientation, a little outlook that was different uh, from other Italian cities. Next. And when I was talking about uh, looking the same in the Canaletto painting, well, this is, these are paintings by Ignazio Dante from the early 1580s from the Gallery of the Maps in the Vatican. It shows the, the various parts of the world, of Europe, of Italy, and then the most important ports. And um, on this, you see the, the map of Venice from the early 1580s, with the exception of adding a, a few bridges and the, the sort of uh, expansion of Dorsodoro. You know, if you could use this map today, right, you could get around Venice with this map. Uh, next slide, please. And also just to make a comparison of medieval town halls, right? This is the Palazzo Ducale in Venice, the seat of government, goes up in the 1330s. Look how extraordinarily open this building is. Huge windows, big arcades. It is so vulnerable because it's claiming just how powerful Venice is. Remember, Venice was the only great medieval city without a wall. It didn't need a wall. It had the Venetian Lagoon and the Adriatic Sea and the most powerful navy of the day. So compare this open city hall to, next, Florence's, right? The Palazzo Vecchio, it's built, it starts a generation earlier, but that is a castle full of tiny windows and uh, little slits for arrows and pouring boiling oil. This is a city that is not confident. This is one that's worrying about being attacked, right? So think about that and part of the Venetian attitude, it's openness, it's pride, uh, it's even arrogance, let's say, next. I want to think a little bit also uh, about the Venetian aesthetic. There's an incredible unity of the Venetian aesthetic based particularly on its watery setting, uh, water, uh, fog, uh, uh, reflections, reflections off of uh, moving water, but also based on a strong Byzantine uh, theme, the idea that some of the most beautiful and uh, important buildings are based on models from Constantinople. So these big Byzantine or Romanesque buildings with large walls, tiny windows, uh, and of course, mosaics, which are made up of glass and stone and things, reflecting light all around. Uh, this is the San Marco, the center, uh, the center of the church. Next. And you see looking up these amazing golden domes you know, to the medieval Venetians, 11th century, when this was begun, uh, the building was completed and there, the decorations begun. This was the vision of heaven, looking up at the domes of San Marco. Next. And this is the same sort of golden glow that we see on the great Renaissance paintings, like this famous Titian picture here, this Annunciation of the Virgin Mary. Next. And this golden glow, of course, is not made up of gold, really, but thousands, millions, rather, uh, of tiny pieces, tessidae. Each uh, piece of a mosaic set slightly off to its neighbor to reflect and catch the light in more beautiful uh, and, and really thrilling ways. Next. And part of the magic of Venice is that sunlight off of moving water can make even the underside of this humble bridge a golden glowing mosaic dome, just like those in St. Mark's. Next. So this exhibition, that's the starting point, Unmasking Venice, American City, American Artists in the City of Water. It is a beautiful uh, medium-sized exhibition, and uh, it's on view now at the Fenimore in Cooperstown until September 5th. And if you're anywhere near, uh, I urge you to go. I drove from Boston to see it a few weeks ago and really enjoyed it. 
uh, and uh, really want to congratulate the exhibition curators, a number of collaborators, but particularly Anne Cannon and Julia Mador. Next. And there you see Anne and me, there we are, uh, in the exhibition uh, a few weeks ago. Next. Uh, so this is American Artists in Venice, and this beautiful sculpture, this marble at the beginning, uh, greets you. It's uh, idealized Venice. It's, uh, it's a sort of... Uh, Allegory of Venice, Venetia, right there she is as an American sculpture. And then we have lots of view paintings, etchings, et cetera, by American artists. And the themes of visitors to Venice, presence of foreigners in Venice, and particularly American women artists and writers is central to this exhibition. Next. Uh, you can see uh, we've got paintings from the 19th century, from the 20th century, nice mix of media, uh, including lots of good works on paper. Next. Um, wonderful quotation. This is Peggy Guggenheim. If anything can rival Venice in its beauty, it must be its reflection at sunset in the Grand Canal. So the Grand Canal is the microcosm of Venice, which is itself you know, the most beautiful city in the world. Next. Um, and for me, a lot of discoveries in this exhibition. One was the American painter, Jane Peterson. She was from 1876 to 1965. And outstanding sort of post-impressionist picture painter, just very beautiful. Uh, uh, and that's those are three different Jane Petersons there. In fact, uh, the one on the right of the clock tower is the cover of the catalog. Uh, so she was a discover from, discovery for me. Next. Um, and then also very important, the presence of Native American art, which is one of the great strengths of the Fenimore Museum, the thought being uh, impossible to prove in all cases, but the idea that much of the beadwork done by Native American artists in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries was actually using beads made in Venice. These were traded, collected, they were compact, they were beautiful, and could be really sent all around the world. And many came to North America from, from Murano. Next. And here I am uh, at the end of the exhibition, chronologically, this very important uh, piece by Fred Wilson called I Saw Otello's Visage in His Mind. Uh, Fred Wilson uh, was the 2003 uh, American representative to the Biennale at the American Pavilion. And uh, this amazing work, multi-layer of black Murano glass without the silver backing, so they're not reflective. They are mirrors that don't succeed in reflecting. So quite, quite a beautiful and uh, haunting work of art. Next. So we're here in part because we love Venice and we're reminded all the time because Venice is almost always in the news. In fact, it's for, my, for me, it's a definition of a slow news day, right? When there's something about Aqua Alta or crowding in Venice, nothing really more important is going on. So various websites and newspapers and TV stations recycle these worries about Venice. Um, and you see here, Aqua Alta, the famous tidal flooding, which used to happen just really in the later autumn and winter, uh, becoming more common, happening more out of season, sometimes in spring, summer. Um, and you also see the crush of tourists, right? This is a city whose economy is very much based on, on visitors, Italian and foreigners, uh, and they come together. You just see, you know, it's hard to get around with uh, a lot of people in your way, but even harder when you're up on the duck boards, uh, trying to get across the low-lying areas of town like the Piazza San Marco. Um, next. But there was a super aqua alta in uh, November of 2019, several days of floods. Uh, this is a kind of famous uh, shot here of a Vaporetto, one of the water buses, a big, big craft being sort of pushed up on the side of the Riva degli Schiavoni. The water had gone so high, almost as much, almost as high as the terrible floods of 1966, which really set uh, all sorts in, uh, of focus on Venice and international attention in motion. Uh, next, please. So the, with the other hat I wear, I'm part of this American organization, Save Venice. You see this on this slide. Uh, we partnered with um, the uh, embassy, or rather the embassy in Washington, reached out to us and said, we'd like to do something for everything Venice suffered in this uh, November 2019 flood. Remember, so many ground floor businesses just had a meter or more of water in them, destroying uh, you know, kitchens and bookstores and all kinds of shops. Uh, all sorts of electrical uh, implements went out. Uh, people lost you know, mattresses and books and everything. It was really quite terrible. And this America Love Venice campaign, uh, working with Save Venice, more than $750,000 was raised uh, in just a few months. And it went directly to help waterlogged public buildings, museums, synagogues, libraries, uh, confraternities, et cetera, in Venice. Next. And this is from the Save Venice website. And you can see uh, people trying to get salt deposits out of wooden furniture in churches and the 
marble floors in various public buildings and churches, trying to do this quickly before the salt really sets in and makes things worse. Next. And so this is the MOSE, M-O-S-E, which is the special, uh, finally, after great, uh, you know, many years of uh, costly construction is now in place. And for higher aqua alte, uh, these uh, can be raised at the three points where the Lido, the great sandbar that separates the Adriatic from the Venetian Lagoon, where they, the water is exchanged, and this can prevent a new high tide from coming in. For some people, it's the salvation, or at least the temporary salvation. Uh, for other people, it's very much part of the problem. The Mose isn't making things better, depending on your point of view. And I'm sure Mose, M-O-S-E, will come up uh, in this discussion. Venice faces many other challenges uh, today and in future uh, decades, like declining population, high cost of housing, scarcity of high paying jobs. Uh, next one. Oh, um, sorry, you see right here, the population dropping, right? Every time it goes from 60,000 to 55,000 or 55 to 50, the year round residents, when that drops, that's occasion for another slow news day story. Um, uh, next slide. And we also have tourists behaving you know, idiotically this just a week ago. Uh, electric surfboards on the Grand Canal. So super dangerous and just uh, you wonder how much this is related to the Instagram, TikTok, social media kind of phenomenon where people want to show off, uh, not just for people around them, but for put it on social media for the whole globe. Um, and uh, but I've also I have to say seen lots of scenes of Venetians behaving uh, idiotically. You know, when I lived there in the late 90s, remember routinely Venetians would take their garbage and drop it in a canal so the tide would take it off, which so ticked me off. But what was I to say uh, as an outsider there? Um, so today's symposium, it's questions of balance, right? Uh, Venice is right on the, uh, right at sea level, right? So just like the water and the land have to be kept in balance, uh, the economy, tourism, uh, population, jobs, all these things uh, need to be kept uh, in balance. So and Venice is important, not just for Venice, but Venice is in fact a wonderful laboratory for the world in that solutions for Venice could help other historic cities in Italy or further afield. They could help other cities sea level, other port cities. And we have today four experts on Venice. All were born there or live there. They love the city and they have different points of view of what we as humans should be doing to prioritize uh, to preserve the city. At the end, they will take your questions. Um, and I'm showing this slide again of Canaletto because I would love at the 300th anniversary of this painting in about 16 years, if Canaletto could come back to Venice and have it look Somewhat changed, but really just the same, because the intactness of Venice is, for me, one of the great secrets and uh, powerful allures of this city. So our first speaker will begin by addressing the physical patrimony of Venice, the extraordinary art and architecture still intact after these centuries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frederick. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker. Melissa Kahn is the director of the Venice Office of Save Venice, an American nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving the artistic heritage of Venice. A longtime resident of Venice with 33 years of experience working for Save Venice in the field of Venetian art, history, and conservation, Kahn coordinates Save Venice's art restoration projects and oversees the Rossend Library and Study Center at Save Venice. In addition, she is the director of the restoration track of Say Venice's Women Artists of Venice program launched in March 2021. Khan is a frequent lecturer in Italy and the United States on the preservation of Venetian art. Born and raised in Salem, Ohio, Melissa Khan has a degree in art history from Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She is married to Venetian architect Fabrizio Tibola and has two sons, Sebastiano and Lorenzo. Melissa? Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk about all our activities in Venice, as Frederick sort of gave you a heads up on Say Venice and what it does. And so today I'm going to sort of explain the importance of conservation in Venice and how it's not just conserving the works of art, but also um, what we do helps to, to contribute to the local economy as well. Okay, St. Venice was founded after the floods of 1966. 
Uh, this great high tide brought the world's attention to the fragile nature of Venice's artistic patrimony. And it's when an appeal was made worldwide that if you had been inspired by Venice as a writer, as an artist, as a musician, you should do something to give back. And that's when international committees were founded. And one of those uh, became Say Venice, taking the name Say Venice in 1971. Now thinking about Venice and its patrimony and why it's so important and why are Americans interested in helping to, to save Venice and work with its artistic treasures. Well, these are so many objects that have had an influence on, on the world. And it's something that belongs to the world as well. Uh, there was a fabulous exhibition um, this past year in Venice that actually Frederick Elchman was one of the curators on Venezia 1600, talking about the 1600 years of the Venetian existence of the Venetian Republic. And the artworks involved, many of them restored by, say, Venice, gave us a glimpse of why things in Venice are so very important. A really interesting piece was a ballot box, a ballot urn, uh, because the word ballot actually in the English language comes from Venetian, ballotto. It was a little cloth ball that was used to cast your vote, sometimes in different colors, and was placed in this urn. So Venice comes even closer to us today when you think about even so part of our language comes from Venice as well as things about government. Venice's identity was very much tied to its republic and displayed through its artwork. Uh, this is an, another amazing painting that say Venice recently conserved. It's actually going to go to Washington in November as part of the National Gallery's Carpaccio exhibition. But this painting also tells us a lot about how Venice saw itself. You have the Lion of St. Mark, uh, the symbol of Venice, and we have the lion's feet are in the water, showing his um, dominance over the sea. His wing is sheltering the ships that come into port, but the lion's paws are on the land to show the Venetian expansion of the mainland, to show the dominance of the Venetian Republic. So all these artworks really tell a story, and it's truly essential that they be preserved and protected and seen in Venice today. You can see how science comes to play even with our conservation. Here you have an infrared reflectogram that the conservators like to make reference to when they're doing conservation treatment because you can see Carpaccio's underdrawing. And this gives us, um, you can see exactly if they're overpainting or other additions that should be removed. But continuing to talk about what Save Venice has done and the importance of the work in saving Venice, we'll go to the island of Murano, known for its glass industry for centuries. Um, it's also well known for its mosaics in the church of Santa Maria San Donato. Save Venice worked here in the 1970s, from 73 to 79, and what became the largest public work project in Venice after the big floods uh, to pick up the mosaic floor and put in a subfloor and relay the floor. But we're still working there today, as just this summer we set up scaffolding to work on the wall mosaic. It's a mosaic that hasn't been restored since 1925, so nearly 100 years. And you can see the, the damage that's been outlined there. And our master restorer, Giovanni Cucco, um, starting his investigation. You see the scaffolding on the exterior because we can't work on the interior without checking the outside to make sure that the vaults uh, can amply support the mosaic. But it's not just about restoring, it's also about teaching. And we try to use our conservation sites as places where um, students can learn. And in this uh, photograph, you have Giovanni Cucco, who's 81 years old, um, telling and explaining to a group of students uh, from the Instituto Veneto Beniculturale Conservation School, so passing on his knowledge. Uh, these students in turn will, you know, eventually have jobs in Venice. They may decide to stay in Venice and live in Venice. So it's a way of adding to the Venetian population, adding to the economy through the educational initiatives. Of course, say Venice's restorations have also brought about new methods. Uh, the Church of the Miracoli was a big project in the 80s, where a new method of stone, dis stone desalinization uh, was experimented and now is used throughout the city where this, actually the marble slabs are put in large vats of deionized water and the salt basically is soaked out and then the slabs put back on the building. And so this type of uh, work that a private organization like Say Venice can take the time to experiment with 
is part of our success. Uh, another great project that Save Venice has been working on for many years is the Church of San Sebastiano. And of course, this is always a collaboration between the Italian Ministry of Culture, uh, between the owners of the artwork, in this sense, the, um, the Catholic Diocese, and the many, many donors of Save Venice who make our work possible. Um, in this situation, we started with the restoration of the ceiling of the church and having a large scaffolding, we certainly couldn't be disruptive We wanted the church to stay open because it still was used for mass, it still had visitors. So that's another point of, in a city like this where you need to do your conservation work, but keep in mind uh, the importance of what's happening around you and not closing something uh, down or taking it away for conservation and sort of being forgotten. Um, the one things we did have to be able to take away were the ceiling canvases. And here you see them in a conservation lab and the Save Venice Board of Directors coming uh, to visit them before we start. And one of the big discoveries of San Sebastiano was about Paolo Veronese's work methods. Uh, it turned out that Paolo Veronese used a pigment called blue smalt, beautiful blue color that was used for skies and large background areas. But what Veronese didn't know was it's a fugitive pigment. It's not stable and it loses its color. And so we were able to identify this in the paintings and uh, determine that these gray, gray skies uh, were all what were left of the blue sky that Veronese had once used. But in conservation, you don't want to add anything. You wouldn't want to repaint a blue sky. And so we just rely on the scientific information to understand what the artwork was supposed to be. In the Church of San Sebastiano, we also have a very, very large fresco cycle, possibly the largest fresco cycle still intact in Venice. And the preservation of that is very important in a city that's climate is difficult because of all the salts and humidity. Now, when you look at this picture, always from the Church of San Sebastiano, you start to learn about the blue small that I mentioned. Here you see the skies are no longer blue or not even gray but the discolored orangish brown, which happens with the uh, deterioration of the blue small. But you also see in this picture uh, what's not there. If you look at the cupola in the area, in the upper part of the presbytery, there's no decoration. This was once covered with frescoes, first by Veronese. Then there were structural problems there and Sebastiano Ricci repainted them in the early 1700s. Uh, now we have nothing. Uh, because of the rebuilding of the cupola in the late 19th century. And this is a reminder of constant care that is needed or we will lose more of Venice's artworks. Uh, a project right now uh, that's just about to reach its completion is the Assumption of the Virgin by Titian and the Ferrari. And what you're looking at is not the painting, it is a scaffolding and a very well done scaffolding cover. It's the photograph of the painting. Um, the painting is being restored on site behind that cover, but we needed to have that, that reproduction because the painting is still being used for what it was made for, for worship. So the, having this uh, reproduction allows mass to take place, worship to take place. And it's also um, quite popular for weddings now because uh, brides can have their wedding in front of the Assumption and not in front of their scaffolding. So it's sort of part of how we get along with the community, adapting our conservation. But the work itself is very important, particularly for this painting, the largest, um, possibly the largest panel painting still on site, an enormous work. Um, having to deal with changes in the climate, we're having to deal with monitoring at the back of the panel, making corrections so it can still stay in the church, and removing overpaint and additions from past restorations. Uh, we're also working on the frame of the Asunta uh, along with the painting, and this will all be completed by um, the end of September of this year with a public presentation on October 4th. So we're all uh, very excited to be able to give the Asunta back to the public. Of course, as Frederick mentioned, the high tides in Venice were certainly, uh, are certainly something we deal with on a somewhat regular basis, but the Aqua Alta of November 12, 2019 was a totally different story, something never seen before, something that continued then for weeks and weeks afterwards. Um, this is something that 
I lived through. I'm here in Venice. Um, and so immediately I was very active with the Immediate Response Fund. It's a committee, um, a fund that Save Venice organized and then later partnered with the Italian embassy to raise funds and do something immediately because that's what has to be done. We can't give the blame to, as to why the, the city flooded because the floodgates weren't ready yet. We needed to go forward and do something at least to save the artworks. And so through a series of projects, here's our Church of San Sebastiano that had been um, flooded and we worked on the floor and building a sub, uh, sub floor in the bell tower. The Church of the Miracoli I mentioned also the interior, first time ever flooding here. These are very high, high buildings working on the floors again and bringing in conservation students who learned from the experience. We also worked extensively in Cadoro, Galleria Franchetti, one of the lowest lying buildings in Venice that was flooded underwater for nearly six weeks straight. Um, also San Donato and Murano, we came back to do more maintenance on the floor. So all this maintenance is very important. Uh, now that the floodgates um, seem to be working and we won't be having these big, big issues, there's still a lot of maintenance to do and we need to be able to work quickly. Um, I like to use this photo to sort of explain life in Venice and particularly the relationship with the water. Um, having raised two boys here, this is a typical scene for me. Um, what these kids are doing is waiting for their ball. They've been playing soccer in Campo San Giovanni in Paolo and their ball has fallen in the water. So they're patiently there waiting for a boat to go by because a friendly boat driver will inevitably pick up the ball and toss it back to them. So it's an interesting example how the water is really a part of everyday life in Venice. It's a friend and it's a foe. The kids lost their, their ball to the water, but the water is going to allow them to get it back. And so that's really how the Venetians see the water. You know, it's just part of our lives here. Um, say Venice, coming back to our, our own um, history, we celebrated 50 years and we adopted two very large projects this past uh, 2021 to celebrate this wonderful anniversary. A project that's now um, coming to full term is in the ghetto of Venice, part of a larger scale project to re, um, re, re, reinstall the museum and restore the historic synagogues. Say Venice is working on the Italian synagogue, um, replastering and reworking the interior. This was a synagogue used by the Italian community as opposed to the German or Levantine or Spanish community for worship in the ghetto. We're also recovering um, an old floor, a floor probably 18th, 17th century terrazzo flooring that had been covered by a modern flooring. So sort of making up for um, past mistakes and going back to as much as we can to the early decoration of this very important temple. We're also working on the island of Tricello, which for Venice is certainly um, was a very important site, the original settlement of Venice earlier than the Venetian uh, development around Rialto. We started uh, working on the mosaics of Torcello and the apses as well. As you can see the crumbling brick and mortar that we faced when we first started our work. The exterior part of the museum, the mosaics in the building are very important as we work on the interior. We again see Giovanni Cucco, our master mosaic restorer, working on them. And here he is there in the 1970s as well. So his long-term knowledge that he's been able to pass on to other students uh, is a very important part of protecting Venice's historic patrimony. We also discovered ninth century frescoes while working in Torcello in an area above the vault of one of the chapels um, under the roof line, so not visible. And what they are, are from the Carolingian um, period. We were able to identify the exact uh, timing because of inscriptions and so from the, the style of the lettering. And this gave us proof that there was decoration prior to the Byzantine mosaics, that Venice was looking um, west a bit before deciding to look east in the Byzantine era. So it's an exciting and important discovery that became world news of this idea of decoration in Venice even earlier than we thought. We continue to work on Torcello, finishing up on the, 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 the left apps at this time, uh, having completed the center and the right as well, and the mosaics inside and out. But another project, very important for Save Venice at this time, is the Women Artists of Venice. 
something new, something we decided uh, needed to be addressed. It's a program to identify um, women artists who worked in Venice. I mean, there were a lot of them, but many times their names aren't known. They work with their father or their brother, they're in the workshop, behind the scenes. There are a few that do come forward, particularly in the early 18th century, like Rosalba Carriera, uh, famous uh, throughout Europe for her pastel drawings, Mariana Calavares, who also worked in pastel. Um, but we're also in not only working with well-known artists, but other artists that have sort of fallen aside because of the poor state of conservation of the artworks. In the situation of Giulia Lama, that you'll see, you'll see the painting from the San, Church of San Marziale overlooked because of its condition. Um, aside, in addition to the conservation part of the program, we're also putting together an extensive database with all the information on all women artists, the artworks they produced, where they are today, where they are in Venice, and then that work. And this eventually will be available on our own website for research. Uh, the Julia Lama paintings are really turning out to be quite spectacular. There are four of them, with, uh, four evangelists. Here you see St. John during cleaning. And again here, you can understand why a painting can be overlooked because of its condition. And once you remove the yellow varnish, and the overpainting, you see what a spectacular artist Julia Lama truly is. We have one more Julia Lama painting on the Lido, Malamocco. And here you see the poor painting with some, looks like some pigeon droppings on it. We uh, hope to be, have our authorization from the Ministry of Culture to take this painting down for conservation treatment starting this fall. It will be another uh, very interesting restoration and in learning more about Julia Lama and her work methods and also the subject of the painting, which is still unclear. Just sort of wrap up of what Save Venice does and how important all our initiatives and restorations are. And just looking back in 2022, uh, this American organization, 501c3 uh, nonprofit, um, had 44 projects, conservation projects going on. And of these 44 projects that included 42 paintings is one project for example, the iconostasis um, uh, and Torcello had 13 panel paintings. Um, we also had stone and marble altars, five of them. We're working on Myolica tiles, 384. The mosaics working on from Torcello and also Murano ends up with an enormous amount of square feet, over 3,000 square feet, as well as a new project for prints, woodcuts, and albums. These projects take place in 18 locations around Venice, just this year alone. And we've engaged 36 conservation firms and conservation specialists. And each firm may have multiple people working for them. So you can imagine um, how these activities can really make a difference on the economy of Venice, on an economy not having to depend completely on tourism. Uh, our educational initiatives are also important and fellowships so that young students and scholars have a chance to continue their work. So to wrap up, I'd like to look back, similar how Frederick did, in thinking that you'd like to have Canaletto in the future see Venice looking exactly the same. I'd like to look at this Gentile Bellini painting of the procession in Piazza San Marco, 1496. Piazza San Marco looking rather busy, as it is today on a Saturday in August. And um, that's what Venice you know, is all about. There are always going to be people here. There are always going to be processions. There's always going to be a lot going on. And it's something that the Venetians have always taken in stride. The water, the people, the economy, just have to keep moving. So I like to think in 500 years, uh, looking back on an image of Venice today, it'll be looking pretty much the same. And I am uh, I'm positive, or I guess I'm optimistic, that organizations like Save Venice, if we sort of just stick to what we do best, we can certainly make a difference on the Venetian life and the Venetian economy. And so uh, with that, I'll turn my, my uh, screen off and on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Melissa. I would now like to introduce our second speaker. Jane Damosto holds an MA from the University of Oxford and an MSc from Imperial College London. She is an environmental scientist and activist based in Venice. 
and is co-founder of the NGO We Are Here Venice. Operating across many different disciplines, We Are Here Venice has a mission to change the future of the city, highlighting the need to protect the lagoon and rebuild a more resilient resident population. Jane has produced a number of books and publications. Alongside running the NGO, Jane has a family and is active in the community and is president of Pan di Zenzero, a pedagogical project for early childhood. In 2017, she was honored with the Ozella d'Oro by the City of Venice, and in 2021, she received the Fondazione Mazzi Prize for Vision and Courage. Jane? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. hear you. Okay, good. Um, first, I want to tell you briefly what what we um, we are here. Venice really is, or at least what we think we're doing. Then I'm going to describe where we are now, borrowing from a report that I recently submitted to the World Heritage Watch, a German NGO that's trying to improve the effectiveness of UNESCO in protecting world heritage all over the world. And in the third and final part of my talk, I'm going to provide some examples of our projects in order to um, rekindle anyone who's lost hope for the future of Venice and also make you aware of some of the different and complementary types of action that we're engaged with compared to the very precious restoration and conservation work that's made possible by Save Venice and the many other dedicated charities that are pre preserving Venetian cultural heritage. We want and we need Venice to do more than just survive. We want Venice to positively flourish in response to the existential planetary challenges that are menacing not just Venetians, but our co collectivity. I'll now start showing you some slides. It's the wrong one. Hang on. Sorry for this. We rehearsed. We had everything going perfectly. Share. No. No. Stop. Just a moment. It's a, I hope you appreciate this pause after Melissa's excellent and very concentrated talk. This is better. So, in black and white, can everybody see the picture of some of my colleagues? In black and white, We Are Here Venice is officially recognized nationally and internationally as a non-profit. And the core team based mainly in Venice consists of eight professionals, each from a different discipline, sociologist, marine biologist, environmental scientist, engineer, economist, art historian, artist and architect. And since this picture was taken, the team has changed a little bit. We also have some um, non-women working with us now. Um, in addition, our advisory board and principal donors bring significant material resources, as well as priceless contributions in terms of advice, expertise, and contacts. Every project that we do combines people from the core team, as well as mainstream academics, local experts, community vol volunteers, functionaries from public institutions in at varying proportions. We, as, we see ourselves as a task force that's working on issues that need to be addressed, but yet aren't yet being addressed by existing institutions. We choose to engage in the areas where we think we can make a difference. And we apply professionalism together with local knowledge, determination, 
and equally importantly, a very long-term vision with a strategy that's based on specific tasks. This is something I've always said, and I was surprised to hear a British general saying that's how he works too on the radio last Wednesday morning. When officially constituted as an organization back in 2015, we produced a, a postcard declaring that Venice is more than its monuments. It's positioned in the middle of a, a lagoon and the fate of which depends on the health of the coastal ecosystem. And our mission derives from this. Our activities are divine, defined by direct experience, scientific methods, and strong visual com communications to bring real changes in terms of the protection and regeneration of the living city, its authenticity, its citizens, and also as regards the fragile lagoon that's inseparable from the rest of the complex urban system we've already had described by Frederick and then Melissa. By living city, we mean a place with a very robust resident population and a model of governance that considers the quality of daily life, community services, all within the special context of the lagoon ecology. We ad advocate that this should be considered a precondition for Venice as a tourist destination. Venice needs to coexist with the visitors rather than be in competition with Venice as a tourist city. And I think that anyone who's visited Venice over the years will be aware of the fact that the quality of the experience has been declining, unfortunately. And we know that there are ways to make life better for, for, for both sectors of the local population, neither more important than the other. Seven years ago, we began by acting as a kind of invisible platform dedicated to strengthening the interconnections between the multiplicity of local organizations, decision makers and politicians, opinion leaders. And, and now we see ourselves instead as some kind of more transdisciplinary collective of professionals with a constructive approach to the urgency of preserving Venice and the opportunities that there are for positive change. We um, published a five-year report last year that anyone is welcome to download from our website. Now I'd like to talk about some of the things that we do and in the context of some of the um, problems of Venice. There's, in recent years, there have been a multiplicity of efforts by civil society in Venice, as well as with support from international organizations to overcome the blockage that there is in the UNESCO World Heritage Programme, considering the widely known and persistent problems that are threatening Venice and its lagoon. And we are calling for the site to be registered as endangered. I'm highlighting this because I believe that America has now returned to funding UNESCO. And I think that America could help bring the right kind of attention to Venice. A quick run through of the critical issues is barely necessary, considering as Frederick mentioned, the widespread media coverage of Venice's deteriorating condition. But I, <laughs> I'll quickly, I guess it doesn't hurt to say things twice. Housing availability is a, has been in, eroded by unfettered market forces, speculative investing, and mass tourism. The supply of social and public housing by the administration and other public and semi-public institutions has also been consistently overlooked. Thousands of housing units are currently lying empty and unassigned by the local government. On top of this, the number of beds available as tourist accommodation first exceeded the number of permanent residents sleeping in Venice back in 2019. Since the pandemic, things have only gotten worse, even though 
everybody was expecting Venice to rethink its relationship to tourism. Likewise, the range of productive activities and jobs in Venice has narrowed significantly. Um, thank heavens, there is all this work in con conservation, but besides that, the, the opportunities for young people are very, very restricted. And the historic city is still losing many traditional activities, along with the repositories of local knowledge that these represent. And the unique characteristics of everyday life and the quality of life for residents with all this tourism is increasingly being compromised by pollution, noise, congestion. And at the same time, I want to draw your attention to vast areas of empty space around Venice not just the empty shops, but also areas like a third of the Arsenale, which could be a perfect substrate for job creation. Another fundamental underlying issue, I'm sorry, the diagram is a bit tricky to read here on the screen, but what, what it shows is that the community living in Venice is losing its political agency because the population has now shrunk. This, um, this blue line here is the population of the historic city of Venice, the fish shape of islands that you all think of when you think of Venice. The green line shows the population of the historic city and the other areas of the lagoon, like the Lido, etc., Murano, Torcello, Burano, Palestrina, and um, this brown line instead is showing the, ri the rise in the population on the mainland. And together, they're this line here, which is the total population of the single municipality of Venice. So with this line going down, these two, the blue and the green, it means that we're mathematically excluded from influencing the democratic processes and political outcomes of Venice. The ecological state of the lagoon is the, the, the fourth and final point I want to mention, because the lagoon system is threatened by erosion, continuing loss of sediments to the sea, which in turn um, does positive feedbacks, causing stronger currents and waves that make the lagoon increasingly like a marine system and removes the inherent resilience of the transitional coastal zone and changes the mixture of plants and animals and challenges the ecological functions of the lagoon but, and their associated values to society in and beyond Venice. All these issues are persistent and have been noted for decades. The Venetian authorities have had more than enough time to introduce the policies necessary to make change. The Cruz paradox, if you'll allow me a couple of minutes, is an emblematic example of what I call unjoined up thinking. There's still no effective resolution to the problem since the so-called sudden ban of cruise ships above 25,000 tons from coming through the heart of Venice. The political statement was made by Mario Draghi, back the soon to be ex prime minister in July of last year. That was nearly 10 years after the Costa Concordia disaster in 2012, when the issue was first pinpointed that Venice needed to be protected from cruise ships. The media excitement and embrace by the UNESCO World Heritage Committee at the meeting hosted by China soon after the, the Draghi law has still not been matched by a satisfactory solution from any of the stakeholder viewpoints, not the local community, the port workers, the cruise sector, economic interests in Venice and around Venice, and not even the cruise lines are satisfied. The reasons for this are obvious. Here's a, it's a slightly old, the slide from 2017, but the issues are the same. Firstly, the environmental unsustainability of gigantism in the cruise sector is a growing issue throughout the world. And the problems that have been evidenced by Venice 
should instead stimulate systemic change within the industry rather than allow the root causes of the problems to be shoved else elsewhere. If the cruise ships are bad for Venice, they're not going to be good for anywhere else in the world. Secondly, Marghera, which has over here, which has been earmarked as a temporary solution, is unsuitable for large cruise ships due to very significant logistical and safety issues due to frequent strong winds making navigation in this shipping channel sometimes dangerous. We could have a repeat of the um, ever given container ship that blocked the Panama Canal last year. Um, and also once the cruise ships reach Marghera, they, they have to dock in very close proximity to industrial activities and contaminated land. To this, I would not need to comment on the attractiveness of being here for the cruise passengers compared to seeing the heart of Venice from their balconies of their cabins. Another thing I want you to know is that existing businesses that are dependent on the container and industrial traffic that is the mainstay of the business in, in Marghera are being compromised by the overlap with cruises that's causing scheduling and spatial problems. And um, it's taking away the, there's the opportunity cost of extra dredging and investment in cruise infrastructure that could instead be invested in ecological transition for existing businesses in Marghera. And finally, the volume of business for Venice-based cruise sector workers has already been reduced dramatically to about, by about 80%. Therefore, the obsolescence combined with the uncertainty surrounding a permanent offshore port, which has yet to be designed, tended and built, make it logical to think about changes in, in productive activities for ex-cruise workers, rather than trying to find a way for them to work on something that we already know is, being, is close to obsolescence. Now to talk about some of our projects quickly. Um, as a research-based collective, we promote activism, inquiry, and co collaboration. Our projects are assessed regularly according to the UN Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, and we have them organized in three overlapping, what we call action areas. Languages of value, exchange of knowledge, and Venice is the Lagoon. By languages of value, we mean putting together the thinking to analyze and better understand the parameters that determine the transformations and trends that are affecting Venice now and in the future. How is it for you is a report that we published in 2019, looking at the potential for greater mutual benefit in the relationship between the living city and the Biennale. Whose city is it anyway is a report we published back in 2020 examining the human resources that constitute the fabric of Venice and the consequences of the changing proportions. Both reports can be downloaded for free from the web. Last year, we were awarded funding by the municipality of Venice that was also, um, well, actually we did crowdfunding that was then matched by the municipality to work with the Bangladeshi community that happens to be, ironically, not just from an area of the world that has the same flooding challenges, and in fact, many of them are already climate refugees. They're also the most numerous non-Italian segment of the local population. And so our idea is to work together with them, not just on building greater awareness of the issues associated with climate change, but also to work together to help the Bangladeshi in terms of greater social 
integration. It's like a visibly invisible segment of the population. Another area of work within the languages of value is uh, work on green spaces in Venice, especially the most underappreciated um, areas of the city that um, and we're going to be working starting this autumn working closely with the community in the specific areas that we've been assigned to work on by the municipality of Venice in caring for the green space not only to get them to look a lot nicer and host important biodiversity in the IUCN has drawn attention to the fact that we have to have these biodiversity corridors across cities so as not to lose precious organisms and the functions they do but also working on green spaces is well known to improve people's lives even according to specific indicators formulated by the world health organization exchange of knowledge is includes moments like this <laughs> when i must say i can't wait to stop having to hear the sound of my own voice and start the q a session with all of you because we learn so much from what others think and wonder about and what others can share and we recognize this explicitly as an important area of our work we also arrange field work and orientation activities for local as well as visiting academic students, workers, etc. Throughout our projects, we are very ser serious about communications and identifying the most effective strategies to raise awareness and at the same time improve understanding of the fundamental issues. Since 2017, we've been regularly using the Municipal Build Posting Service to capture attention and take our messages directly into this mainstream. Solo transitori, which means temporary contracts only, is a poster series that was designed to highlight the problem of affordable housing in Venice, with specific reference to the numerous abandoned commitments by public for public housing. And it also includes some interviews and podcasts to make to connect the actual scientific data that we um, produced in collaboration with the Osservatorio Ocho and to connect it to like people's real stories and narratives to help the um, issues be better understood. As regards Venice and the Lagoon, I'd like to highlight that we're we've been selected for a five-year grant from the European Commission under the umbrella of the New Green Deal. The Waterlands project involves 32 partners and um, an investment, a fully funded 23 million euro grant from the European Commission for all the partners in the project to develop an innovative approach to the recreate in specifically as regards Venice, but other wetlands across Europe are involved. We're going to be working on the recreation of salt marsh to optimize the ecological functionality and the reuse of dredged sediments when possible. For almost two millennia, Venice has survived and thrived despite constant tensions between human interventions and the natural dimensions the natural dynamics of this intriguing territory. Repeatedly over the centuries, Venice has demonstrated its distinctive strength and cultural identity that we like to think is indestructible. But we also have to acknowledge that since the 1960s, a different scale of problems has afflicted the city and the lagoon at the social, administrative, economic and environmental levels. The mission of We Are Here Venice is to bring the lagoon and the natural capital that it hosts back into the center of all thinking, leading to decisions concerning the future of Venice as a living city. It really was far-sighted of UNESCO to endorse the unity of the built heritage of Venice 
together with its natural context and the significance of Venetian civilization as a beacon of humanity when defining the site in 1987. This obviously echoes the governance approach of the long lasting Venetian Republic, the Serenissima. However, Venice and the Lagoon as one world heritage site is especially relevant right now in the face of the climate emergency, where the preservation of nature is needs to go hand in hand with measures to mitigate and adapt to global change and the need to reach carbon neutrality as soon as possible. Issues associated with climate justice, considering the shrinking resident population of Venice, together with the undeniably huge overspend for the flood defense system called MOSE, which Frederick explained, described earlier, it does set a lot of alarm bells ringing when compared, for example, to the fate of the whole nation that is Bangladesh. However, we are propositioning a different way of looking at this, that the regeneration of the lagoon system, including significant expansion of the areas of salt marsh in the lagoon, combined with adaptive management of the sediment balance and the hydrodynamics using what we call in engineering nature-based solutions, is integral to the protection of Venice as a living city, together with its distinctive civilization and lagoon biodiversity. And only in this way will we maximize the resilience of the system in the face of sea level rise and more frequent extreme weather events. Once global climate change goes beyond this so-called Venice threshold, when th flooding will be too frequent for any kind of flood defense system that, that won't be able to provide at least the minimum conditions for lagoon circulation, we argue that system instability will have advanced beyond the point of no return and saving or not saving Venice in whatever shape or form will be a marginal issue amidst what scientists often refer to as the sixth mass extinction. Davide Zanchettin, the next speaker, will be telling us more about how much sea level rise to expect in Venice. And of course, among the UNESCO sites at risk, there are, of course, more extreme cases of fragility and mismanagement. But if we cannot show in Venice how good management can work in such an iconic place, what hope is there for elsewhere? And we advocating for Venice to transition from being everybody's worst nightmare of global problems, a victim of all the worst trends afflicting humans, to being a protagonist of positive change. Our name affirms our conviction that it's the people who live, work, spend time in Venice, who know best what needs to be done for their own well-being, how to look after the city, and protect the lagoon in the light of local value systems, traditions, and making all this knowledge available to the world. Hence another motto of our association that in fact was coined by Vivian Westwood, the fashion designer, our first main supporter. She said, Venice for the Venetians, Venice for the world. And for this, we imply that the international support that people like you are providing, that Say Venice provides, is so essential to bring extra energy, resonance and resources to support the regeneration of Venice, beginning with revitalizing the local population and showing how positive changes are really possible to better reconcile economy and environment via technological innovations and new organizational approaches. The proven feasibility in Venice can then be scaled up elsewhere in many other places with so many similar issues, in, li in line with our larger ambition to ensure that all our work has global resonance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane. I would now like to introduce our third speaker. 
Davide Zanchettin is associate professor at the Calfoscare University of Venice, where he currently teaches classes on various topics of geophysics at the master and PhD levels. He is also affiliated with the Euro Mediterranean Center for Climate Change and the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology. Among his research interests are the study of decadal climate variability and predictability, particularly for the North Italian region, and the study of marine circulation in the Mediterranean Sea and the Lagoon of Venice by means of numerical models. He has co-authored more than 70 papers on international peer-reviewed scientific journals and co-authored an award-winning book on climate change in 2010. He is currently coordinating scientific research to define future climate change scenarios for Venice. Davide? Thank you very much, Danielle, for the nice introduction. <clears throat> and I would like also to thank uh, the previous speakers for illustrating Venice as an iconic place and a paradigm for of a huge historical and cultural values uh, risk. So the frequency of the flooding of the city center have dramatically increased in recent decades, and this threat is expected to continue to grow and possibly even accelerate uh, through this century. And with this presentation, I aim to illustrate some key scientific facts that connect uh, Venice, sea level variations, and climate change, and uh, at the end provide also a glimpse at the future of Venice as far as our current understanding of climate changes allows us to. So the history and the very essence uh, of Venice uh, uh, are tightly intertwined with the sea and the lagoon, which have represented a source of resources and wealth and a natural defense system against enemies. This painting illustrates the Bucin Toro during the Festa della Sensa in Ascension Day, when at the time of the Republic of Venice, the Doge would throw a gold wedding ring into the lagoon as a sign of marriage with the sea. He would say, we marry you, sea, in sign of true and uh, everlasting dominion. However, on the one hand, the threat of floods has always been present. And on the other hand, Venetians have engaged in an enduring struggle against sedimentation in the lagoon. So uh, the UNESCO writes in 1987 that Venice symbolizes the people's victorious struggle against the elements as they managed to master a hostile nature and its habitat has become vulnerable as a result of irreversible natural and climate changes. So the month of November 2019 revitalized the public concern and the political discussion regarding the frailty of Venice and the need to safeguard it against the elements with a global mediatic echo. During November 2019, uh, it has already been mentioned, 15 flooding events above 110 centimeters of a peak water height were recorded, recorded four of which about 140 centimeters, which corresponds to about 60% of the city area being flooded. The peak value was observed on November 12th with uh, a level of 187 centimeters, the second uh, peak value observed in the instrumental period. So the economic impact uh, with damages worth of uh, tens of millions of euros and the social impacts were such that a new name was labeled for this event in order to distinguish it from the previous Aqua Alta events. So Aqua Alta stands for high water. The November 2019 event was referred to and is still referred to the Aqua Granda, which means uh, the big water. The Aqua Granda somehow uh, promoted an acceleration in the completion of the MOSE protective system, uh, which was under construction since uh, 2003, so more or about uh, uh, 20 years. MOSE stands for Modulo Sperimentale Electromeccanico or uh, Experimental Electromechanic Module, and it is a protective system based on uh, mobile barriers at the lagoon inlets, and the barriers are raised if an exceptional surge is forecasted in order to cut off the lagoon from the sea. The efficacy of the MOSE was demonstrated with the first pre-operational closure on October 3rd, 2020. 
We can track sea level changes inside and outside the lagoon during that day in the figure to the right here. And you can see that while the sea level height reached values of around 110, 120 centimeters outside the lagoon here during the peak of the event, the level remained around 60, 70 centimeters inside the lagoon here. But must be noted that with such sea levels, even at 60, 70 centimeters, parts of the city are still flooded. So uh, the mosaic probe effective, but there are still some caveats uh, that must be considered for its operational use. First of all, the MOSE relies on reliable forecasts of the sea level height. MOSE will not protect from intermediate surges, and MOSE is not designed for prolonged closures. We can discuss that later on in the Q&A if you are interested. But what are Aqua Alta events? They are compound events. It means that uh, floods are determined by the superposition of several processes that include meteorological surges, seiches, astronomic tides, and sea level variations on longer term, from seasons to decades and even centuries. I will focus here only on two of these contributions, astronomical tides, that are sea level variations that result from the Earth rotation and, to, and from uh, gravitational effects of uh, celestial bodies such as the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon. In the Venice Lagoon, the astronomical tide is predominantly semi-diurnal, so one can expect uh, two tidal maxima and two tidal minima per day. And the astronomical tide has an amplitude of, of about 50 centimeters. Note that the lowest part of the central St. Mark Square is approximately 55 centimeters above the present mean sea level. So nowadays, a positive water height anomaly that is only a few centimeters above the astronomical high tide can flood it. Meteorological surges are often the major contribution to a storm surge event, and uh, they are associated to sea level changes induced by the effect on the sea of atmospheric circulation, especially linked to winds. Typically, surges are associated in Venice with a strong sirocco, which is illustrated in the panel to the right, which is a southerly wind blowing from northern Africa over the Ionian Sea and farther into the Adriatic Sea. And in doing so, it piles up uh, waters towards uh, uh, the northern Adriatic coast, hence increasing sea levels there, including sea levels in the Venice Lagoon. I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that uh, the threat of floods has always been present in Venice, but observations tell us that uh, very clearly that the frequency of floods has increased in the course of the past 150 years. So this diagram here illustrates each bar is the number of flooding events exceeding the threshold of 120 centimeters per decade since uh, uh, the beginning of the 20th century. It is clear that there is an increasing trend in the frequency of floods and some and the same phenomenon, so to say, that was uh, sporadic with uh, possibly not an event every year at the beginning of the 20th century became uh, a recurrent uh, phenomenon in the early 21st century with possibly events every year. The sudden increase in the flood frequency in the 1960s, 60s, we are here, uh, which includes also the record uh, event uh, in November 1966, motivated a number of political actions. In 1963, 73, sorry, uh, the Italian government enacted the law Legge Speciale per Venezia, which stands for Special Law for Venice, that indicated strategic objectives, procedures, and institutional responsibilities towards the goal of safeguarding Venice. Among the consequences, the Centro Maree was established in the 70s, and an operational forecasting system has been in place since the last 40 years. Also, the idea of a protective system based on mobile barriers, which eventually led to the MOSE, uh, was born in the early 80s. The black curve in this uh, slide illustrates the evolution of relative sea level in Venice measured by the tide gauges located within the city. It allows us to quantify the local relative sea level rise in the course of the past uh, 150 years, more or less. 
as you see here, it is the numbers are written, relative sea level rise is estimated in about 2.5 millimeter per year, which sum up for the last 150 years in an increase of the, sea, of the relative sea level of about 35 centimeters or 14 inches. It is proved that uh, uh, relative sea level rise is the factor that has produced the past increase in the Venice flood frequency. In fact, there is no robust evidence of any intensification of the meteorological conditions associated with the storm surges. So, for instance, we do not observe an intensification of strong Sirocco events. And the fact that we can link flooding and the increasing frequency of flooding with increased uh, increasing the relative sea level um, make us concerned about the future of Venice, especially as far as we connect the, the local sea level changes in Venice with global sea level changes and global warming. I don't have time to illustrate the basics of anthropogenic climate change. I'd be happy to discuss this in the next discussion session. Uh, I only would like to stress here the connection between global warming and global mean sea level rise. So the curve in this figure um, illustrates the global mean sea level rise since the late 19th century. And it depicts an increase of about uh, 18 centimeters in, uh, since the year 1900, uh, which is associated to a rise in the global mean surface temperature of about 1.2 degrees Celsius during the same time. The two facts are connected. The connection being explained by two main processes. First of all, in a warming planet, ice sheets and ice caps tend to melt and through runoff, the water stored as ice over the continents enters the oceans, providing a mass addition and therefore a sea level rise. Note that uh, the ice sheets uh, um, have a potential, if completely melted, to rise the global sea level by several tens of meters. Okay, so something estimated currently in about 70 meters sea level rise. Mm. Then in a warming planet, also the oceans absorb heat, which is associated to an increase in volume. Hence, due to the constraint posed by the bathymetry, the solid floor, this is seen as a sea level rise. So we understand quite well the connection between global warming and increase in the global mean sea level. But global mean changes may not be representative of local changes. The main panel in this figure, the one that I'm going over now with the cursor, illustrates a map of sea level changes in millimeter per year. You can see it here. Since 1950, we can see that the sea level change is not homogeneous. As there are regions that experience strong rise, these are the red colored regions like the Western Equatorial Pacific and regions that instead experienced even a sea level drop. These are the blue regions, for example, the Eastern Equatorial Pacific or the Western North Atlantic. This diversity of trends reflects changes in the ocean circulation, mostly driven by winds. Also the top and bottom panels illustrated the evolution since 1950 of relative sea levels in selected coastal locations around the world. In all panels, the red line represents the evolution of the global mean sea level. And it is clear that global mean sea level changes are not necessarily representative of local coastal sea level changes. Look, for instance, at Manila here, the, one, the panel at the, the bottom, the central panel, which experienced a much stronger sea level rise compared to the global mean sea level. All Stockholm here in the top right panel that experience instead a clear drop in sea level in contrast to global sea level rise. So uh, the opposite of that what we observe in, uh, in the global mean. In fact, for coastal regions, it is the relative sea level that matters. It describes the relative position between sea surface and land surface, and the latter can change also due to vertical land motions. Therefore, we need to understand the different contribution to, contributions to relative sea level change in Venice before attempting any prediction. So this is the observed time series, the evolution of relative sea level in Venice, and we need to decompose it into different processes. 
So the first major contribution is subsidence. Subsidence is uh, the sinking of the terrestrial surface in a certain area. It has a natural component, typically related to processes that act on thousands or millions of years. In Venice, there are several processes that uh, uh, contribute to natural subsidence. One is, for example, tectonics. For instance, the subduction of the Adriatic plate under the Apennines. Another relevant process is uh, the so-called glacial isostatic rebound, which is the rise of land masses after the removal of the huge weight of ice sheets during the last glacial period. In this case, I'm speaking about the alpine ice sheet, of which today we see only little remains. Another relevant process is sediment compaction, as Venice lies at the current edge of the Po River Plain, and it is built over a one kilometer thick layer of quaternary sediments that are progressively being compacted by effect of their own weight. Natural subsidence is today estimated in Venice in about uh, a loss of ground level of about one millimeter per year. Anthropogenic subsidence in Venice is historically linked to overpumping of uh, groundwater and natural gas to support intense civil and industrial development that especially occurred between 1930 and uh, the 70s. And this led to a loss of up to 10, 20 millimeter per year, depending on the location, which only partly recovered when legislation following the November 1966 flood put a limit to groundwater withdrawal. And you can see here in the figure, this is the curve of subsidence, the gray one. And you can see really this kind of acceleration of sinking of the ground linked to the water extraction. And then some recovery here, but still a net loss of something in between eight, 10 centimeters that uh, uh, were not gained again by, again by the surface. It's also important to note uh, that uh, subsidence contributes to about half the observed increase in relative sea level rise in Venice. So if we remove the contribution of subsidence, we ought obtain the blue curve in this uh, figure, which represents the climatic component of relative sea level variations in Venice. To explain this component and the trend, the rising trend, we have to consider that the Venice Lagoon is connected with the North Adriatic, with the North Adriatic, uh, which uh, through the Strait of Otranto is connected to the Mediterranean Sea, which in turn is connected to the North Atlantic through the Strait of Gibraltar, which is a narrow strait with a minimum width of 18 kilometers. But overall, we can expect that due to this chain of uh, uh, connections, we might link relative sea level change climatic component in Venice to sea level changes in the North Atlantic Ocean in the uh, proximity of the Strait of Gibraltar. And this is in fact uh, what we observe. If we superpose to the relative sea level curve without subsidence in Venice, the curve that describes the evolution of sea level in the eastern North Atlantic, we obtain a substantial superposition with some differences, of course. This provides nonetheless a basis to explore future scenarios of any sea level rise. So what's about the future? From what we have seen so far to explore uh, what the future could bring for Venice in terms of flooding, we need to estimate the future evolution of two big contributions to changes in the local relative sea level, so subsidence and climate change. Of course, science does not work with crystal balls, but relies on understanding. For subsidence, we can only predict natural variations, which are slow and therefore expected to continue acting during the current century as they did in the past century. This corresponds to an expected sinking of about one millimeter per year ongoing through the 21st century. So a drop of 10 centimeter more or less is expected by the end of the 21st century. Anthropogenic subsidence is a big unknown. It depends on regulation, on human choices, but uh, history demonstrates it has the potential to cause permanent losses in the order of 10 centimeter per decade. 
For the climatic-driven changes, the complexity of the climate system and its dependency on human actions, which are really not predictable as the case for uh, anthropic subsidence, uh, we need to rely on numerical models. So how does it work? Very broadly speaking, hypotheses about the socio-economic development, hence atmospheric greenhouse gas emissions, are applied to mathematical models in numerical experiments to obtain scenarios that are technically defined projections of climate and, in our case, of sea level change. Before we look into sea level projections for Venice, allow me to make this necessary premise. So, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Crash test dummies are wrong in the sense that they are not humans, but they represent realistically relevant aspects of the human body that allow us to determine consequences on humans of car accidents. Hence, in this sense, they are useful to design safer cars. Similarly, we must be confident that the models that we use to predict climate represent realistically all the key aspects of the climate system. So what is a climate model? The definition is that a climate model is a computer uh, simulation of the Earth's climate system obtained by solving differential equations based on the basic laws of physics, fluid motion and and chemistry. If this definition sounds complex, it is be because uh, climate models are utterly complex tools and they embed our current best understanding of the functioning of the climate system. The figure to the left here is an example of a scheme of an air system model. Just uh, take into account that uh, some of the many processes included in the scheme are well understood but some others are not so well understood. And even processes that are theoretically well understood may not be well represented in the climate model, mainly because of limitation related to, re to the resources that are needed to perform the simulations. And indeed, due to the complexity of the models, the simulation must be performed on computer clusters, something like is illustrated on the figure to the right, that are large sets of computers connected together. The models do not solve the equation everywhere. They just solve the equation in certain discrete points in space and time that we refer to as defining the resolution of the model. And the resolution of the model is most often limited by computational costs. Therefore, there is need to uh, discretize and to optimize discretization. What does it mean to discretize? I would like to illustrate discretization and its implications with an example that I expect that you are familiar with. So the image to the left is obviously a photo of the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, <clears throat> uh, through discretization, the original continuous object is separated into contiguous intervals or bins and a discrete value is associated to each bin. Depending on the size of the intervals or bins, the discretization yields many or few values that describe the original ob object. So, if the bins are small in size, like in the central panel here, there is little loss of detail and the characteristic features of the original object are preserved. Everyone, I'm sure, would recognize that this is a representation of the Mona Lisa. This would be a good discretization. If beans are large in size, or like in the right panel, some of the details of the painting are lost and someone may not even recognize this as being the Mona Lisa or a paint of a woman. So this is an insufficient discretization. Of course, as far as climate models are concerned, the level of resolution or the discretization depends on the question we want to answer. If we are interested in sea level variations in the Mediterranean Sea and ultimately in Venice, a model with a resolution like the one in the left panel could provide a good enough discretization. For instance, with the Gibraltar Strait being well resolved. The quality of the simulations of the Mediterranean Sea circulation by the model in the middle panel would be certainly lower than the high resolution model. As for instance, Italy and the Otranto Strait are very poorly represented here. And a model with a resolution 
as in the right panel is basically useless to study Mediterranean sea circulation. So resolution is also associated with the need of parametrization. Parametrization means that a process is not explicitly resolved by the model because it is, uh, its size is smaller than the resolution of the model. And it is therefore, it must be represented in a simplified version. Parametrizations apply to many processes, including clouds, for instance, but also straight dynamics and can cause model biases and uncertainties. The key point is that the current resolution of global climate models is not yet sufficient to represent the Venice Lagoon, hence to make sea level projections for Venice. We need, therefore, to rely on the information that these models uh, provide about sea level changes, like we have seen in the eastern North Atlantic, with all the caveats that this brings. So let's have a look finally at. Uh, uh, relative sea level projections for Venice under two emission scenarios. So what is shown here is the historical time series of Venice we have seen before in black. And then we have two scenarios and uh, these are model results. The uncertainty reflects uh, the different specificities of the model. So in blue we have uh, an optimistic scenario. So uh, small emissions, and uh, this is called the RCP 2.6, and we have uh, also a pessimistic scenario in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, the RCP 8.5. As you see, at the end of the century, the projected sea level rise ranges from about 30 to something around 110 centimeters, and uh, this could grow to above 180 centimeters if an unlikely but plausible high-end scenario is realized where ice sheets melt faster than currently observed. This is this line here, okay? And we know that ice sheets have the potential to realistically push the climate system and therefore the sea level rise in Venice along this trajectory. The future sea level rise will be the key factor determining the future duration of extreme water heights above the safeguard threshold, which correspond to the duration of the closures of the inlets by the Mose mobile barriers. Closing the inlets for three weeks per year is unlikely uh, before the 2040s. You can see it here, okay. But virtually become certain before the end of the century here. All the projections lie above this line here. Even under a low emission scenario, that's the uh, critical point to highlight. Closures of two months per year are unlikely before the late 2050s, even under a high end emission scenario here. We can also note uh, that uh, a six month closure per year, we can, which can be used, for example, as a criterion for considering the present defense strategies to be inadequate and requiring new additional actions, is likely to occur before the end of this century under a high emission scenario. So here, this shows that if the climate evolves through this trajectory here, it is very likely that uh, we meet a point where the Moses system becomes uh, um, impractic impracticable. Also to give a few more numbers, the 100 year extreme sea level uh, in the Northwestern Adriatic Sea, which is representative for Venice. So the extreme flood event uh, that we expect to occur once in a century is likely to rise by 26 to 35 centimeters by 200, 2050 under the RCP 8.5 high emission scenario and to rise by 53 to 171 centimeter by 2100. And uh, on the one hand, these values are scary and they motivate to consider the search of new adaptive planning of coastal defense for the city. But on the other hand, uh, I have to highlight uh, the large uncertainty that we see in our projections, which limits the generation of constrained climate information and poses major challenges for policymaking decisions on the, develop on the development of effective ad adaptation measurements. So I would like to conclude uh, my presentation uh, with a connection with arts, because uh, we know that sea level 
rise in Venice is ongoing since centuries, well before the modern industrial era, and we know this is due to subsidence. And uh, uh, the painting by Canaletto, which uh, were made with the help of a camera obscura and were just like real photographs with accurate reproduction of all the tiny details of uh, scenes around uh, the 18th century Venice, uh, helped us to constrain uh, the estimates of uh, subsidence in the city. This is because all these details uh, included also the layer of algae living, living between the high and the low tide, you see it here, and we see the same algae living at a different uh, quote as of today. And by comparing the level at which this uh, I believe in the painting and the current observations, we can estimate uh, how much Venice has sunk uh, since the 18th century. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Davide. I would now like to introduce our fourth speaker. Fabio Carrera was born in Venice and has been a professor at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, or WPI, since 1988, when he founded the WPI Venice Project Center. He also founded and directs the Santa Fe Project Center, which is dedicated to indigenous issues. In 2017, Fabio founded Serendipt, Serenissima Development and Preservation Through Technology, a benefit company with the mission of repopulating the historic city of Venice by fostering the creation of innovative, non-extractive jobs for young people of all ages and Venetians of any origin. Serendipt operates the H3 Factory, a startup incubator in the ex-church of Saints Cosmos and Damien on the Giudecca Island in Venice. Serendipt is the lead organization for the Venice case study of the EU Horizon research project called Smart Desk, investigating the exclusion of residents due to the over-reliance on the tourism economy. In 2022, Serendipt launched the MIT DesignX program, where MIT faculty will accompany 10 startups from ideation to launch every year at the H3 factory. Fabio? Hello, can you see the screen and hear me? Everything good? Yep. Yes, yeah. indeed. Okay. <clears throat> All right, thank you everyone for, uh, for your in, uh, interesting talk so far. And I'm gonna talk about a, an aspect that's been mentioned before, and we've been talking about saving Venice, saving the lagoon, and uh, I think my presentation is more about saving the Venetians. and. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So first, I'm going to introduce what Serendipity is. It's a benefit company. It stands for Serenissima Development and Preservation Through Technology, but it's also obviously a pun on words. It's a Serendipity is how we pronounce it. Um, and the, the goal of Serendipity is to uh, foster the creation of, uh, of jobs in the city of Venice through a variety of, uh, of programs that we do that I'm going to introduce to you. You can look at all this through our website, which I'm not going to uh, show you right now, but you can find it at the end. There's going to be a URL for it. And where we are is in what we call the H3 factory, which is a church and adjoining build buildings in on the Judeca Island, island uh, not too far from the Palanca stop. And uh, it's it used to be a, uh, a church connected to the adjoining convent, founded in 1583, um, and it's dedicated to Saints Cosmas and Damien. Cosma Damiano is the uh, name of the church. It stopped being a church in the um, uh, early 1800s after Napoleon uh, took over uh, Venice and uh, in during the Austrian domination in the uh, during the Industrial Revolution, really, where the Judeca became the industrial core of the city, the church was transformed into a factory, a garment factory uh, run by the Herrian brothers. So it was called the Fabrica Herrian, 
And you can see in this picture the arches of the apses in the background, and pretty much the whole church was turned into a three-story factory until not too long ago, until 1987, at which point it was abandoned, and then the city uh, restored it with the European funds to, to be actually a startup incubator. And uh, it's now pretty much half of it is a church with the frescoes and, and uh, apses. And the other half uh, where the pews normally would be is a glass um, uh, cube of, uh, of, uh, for offices and for startups. Serendipity uh, received, was uh, granted the use of the space after RFP in 2017. And uh, so Serendipity is now part official partner of the with the city to uh, to reestablish this place as a, as a real startup incubator, and uh, and we have this until twenty twenty seven, and that's what we plan to do with it is precisely what it was designed for. So what we do at Serendipity are three main things: we do research, culture, and startups. So in the research uh, world, we, we work with uh, WPI, uh, where I'm a professor, been doing that since 1988, and we also work on grants. Uh, we also do culture with an entity called Cosmo that uh, puts up shows and productions in the ground floor of the church and into the apses and even outside. And we also do startups through the programs that I'm going to introduce to you today. That I'm, that I'm aimed at creating and fostering the creation of startups that create jobs that then repopulate the city. So in terms of research, we have a pretty big uh, scientific network of collaborations, um, but the primary one is with WPI, the Venice Project Center that I created in 1988. Since then, we've done over 250 studies uh, on various, almost all aspects of the city. Almost all of the things that were talked about today, we did some sort of research on since 1988. Had over a thousand students come over from the US uh, at the rate of about 28 per year. And we're actually going to increase that in the next couple of years, uh, up towards to 72 students per year are going to be coming to uh, conduct their research in Venice in the future, in the immediate future. Um, sorry, I just uh, clicked the wrong button. I'm going to quickly show you just a little bit of what we've done over the years in in uh, in Venice with the Venice Project Center. Um, if you go to our website, which is VeniceProjectCenter.org, you'll see you'll find all of our student projects, and you know just. You know, you can search for anything here, anything having to do with canals will pop up. Uh, it's, you know, it's a dynamic uh, database, so it pulls it up slowly, but you find. So everything that we've done in over the years, you can find here. We also have a number of applications that you can play with that are more interactive. So you can find all our uh, reports and a whole bunch of uh, applications like for example the, the barbary application which some of you may have seen where we actually display all the uh, important stuff that's uh hidden in the old maps of venice uh including uh information about all the objects that were found on these maps just i'm just giving you like a quick glance at the type of things that you can find in our um in our websites, but uh, I'm not gonna, that's that's not the object of today's presentation. I just want you to know that we've sort of done a, uh, a wide variety of research projects in Venice with the Venice Project Center and the thousand of students that have come to Venice since 1988. And that continues to this day. We have students come in uh, on the 20th of October this, this year to continue the research. We also work on grants. We, um, I'm just gonna quickly explain the, the two latest grants. Uh, first of all, the Italis grant, just again, to give you an idea of the range of things that we've done. Uh, we were inspired by the fact that our uh, church has a bell tower that we don't really know what to do with. 
And so we were thinking of uh, perhaps turning it into a greenhouse for uh, urban agriculture. So we conducted a whole uh, grant project on this in 2019 and <clears throat> looking at you know the potential for urban agriculture circular economy sustainable food you see in the picture here and hydroponic um, uh, sy system on the left a greenhouse system there uh, and we also um, installed a uh, in the middle here you see a farm bot a farming robot that we still have and we're going to be using for uh, educational programs with uh, children in venice and conducted workshops and labs and a, and a hackathon to come up with ideas for actual productive kind of uh, 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 companies that could, uh, you know, pro, you know uh, come up in Venice, be created in Venice to uh, to support this type of uh, activity. So that's just an example of the the second oldest, uh, second most recent project that we've done. But this is the most recent is Smart Test which is a uh, e uh, EU Horizon 2020 project, three year long. It includes um, eight case study cities, uh, 12 partners, and basically all cities that are affected by over tourism in Europe, the main ones, Amsterdam, Lisbon, Barcelona. And uh, the idea is to look at the exclusions created uh, by over tourism in the in all these cities and uh, figure out what their causes are and potential solutions and, and even policies that could be implemented to uh, to uh, uh, mitigate the uh, the process of exclusion that happens with over tourism and and serendipity is in charge of the uh, Venice case study in this project and so what we decided to look at in terms of exclusion is the exclusion of residents hence the title of the presentation so the the depopulation basically of venice and looking at it from three different lenses the lens of the jobs the sort of essentially the quality in other words the, the salaries paid uh by the various jobs in venice and how diverse the jobs are and they're not diverse they're mostly in the field of tourism or or services and then the other lens is the housing, obviously an important factor in Venice in the quality and the cost of housing versus the salaries that are paid in Venice is, uh, is what we're studying as well. And finally, transportation, <clears throat> because uh, the, uh, the way people can move around and in and out of the city is very important for a future uh, uh, of a city that could uh, provide jobs in, in, uh, in uh, uh, industries other than tourism and getting customers and clients in and maybe goods in and out of the city is a big issue and the speed and cost of that is uh, is obviously a factor so that's our overall framing of the um, uh, of our role in the venice case study of the smart desk project and i'm going to give you some um, a little bit of information of what we found uh, from this so far so we're looking at the you know the fact that venice lost about 125,000 uh, residents since world war ii and uh, uh, so part of what we did um, among other things we looked at all the existing data obviously on all these factors jobs housing and, and uh, mobility but we also conducted interviews um to uh, to explore the, you know the, the cause of the of this uh, of this exodus but first, let me start with just a little bit of history here on the population. You know, just we looked at the, the uh, trends on uh, sea level. Now we're, let's look at the uh, population levels here. Uh, maybe you haven't seen this kind of graphic because it goes way back into the 1300s before the first uh, plague pandemic. This is historically uh, extracted data to create this graph. And you can see all the, uh, the bottoms of all these uh, uh, lines are all related to plagues that happen periodically through the Middle Ages in Venice. But the interesting thing to note in each case is that uh, after the plague ended, Venice pretty much always rebounded. Uh, and all the way to even after the fall of the Republic, uh, after which Venice 
also rebounded and reached its peak, uh, a recorded peak of 175,000 in the census of 1951. Uh, but no, no, also that in the uh, you know, middle of the 1500s or so, uh, there was a, a population peak uh, of over 170,000 in Venice, uh, which was only a little lower than the historically recorded one uh, right, right after World War II. But the real question is, uh, after that, the, the population has been declining steadily at a rate of at least a thousand people a year. And the real question here is, will it ever rebound? Because we're just, we keep going down. Uh, historically, Venice was able to repopulate, but can it do it now is the big question. And here's another look at the same um, at the first part of the of this uh, of this graphic here, <clears throat> from the fall of the Republic until World War II, what happened? Well, what happened was first of all, of course, we had the uh, um, the uh, the foreign dominations by France and Austria in the 1800s, up until the uh, uh, the inclusion of Venice in the Kingdom of Italy in, in 1866. Uh, and that was also the period of industrial revolution, as I said earlier, and that happened pretty much when we were under Austrian domination. And then that's when uh, the Judeca became the industrial zone of, of Venice with all the uh, factories there named after German people like uh, Wolstuki, which is actually Swiss, and uh, uh, Dreher, the beer, Jungans, the clockmaker. And Harian, where we we are, which was a a, um, a garment factory, so that's what happened then. So that kept uh, you know kept people working in in the thousands in Venice. Uh, then what happened in after you know towards the end of the 1800s and early part of the 1900s was that uh, it was the creation of Greater Venice. Um, Venice was a, a, um, a municipality of its own. The historic city was a, its own, had its own mayor. Mestre had its own. Malamocco even had its own mayor and so forth. But in the, in the up until the fascist uh, uh, years, uh, Venice became bigger and bigger, essentially by annexing all the adjoining uh, towns. And that obviously made the population grow. Um, and uh, was concluded with the annexation of Mestre in 1926. Since then, as you see from this uh, this timeline, we've had five referendums to re-separate <laughs> from Mestre, all unsuccessful. Uh, and also we had a secession of our own when Cavallino uh, seceded from, from Venice in 1999. But since World War II, pretty much, uh, which was the peak, Population just been steadily declining to the point where, as you all know, we're at about 50,000 people today. And no sign in sight that this is going to be stopped anytime soon. Another way of looking at the same data is uh, through the lenses of uh, Clara Zanardi, who wrote an excellent book uh, called The Bonifica Humana, where she explains that, yes, while the, while the city of Venice was getting bigger by annexing all the adjoining towns, um, at the same time, during the fascist year, because of this uh, expansion of what was considered to be Venice at that point, because of that, uh, there was a, a, a design, really, a plan uh, put in place by the, the, during the fascist era to you know, create a polycentric kind of city where the historic city became more where the headquarters and the management uh, would be, uh, but uh, the industry would be now in Marghera, which is at that point part of Venice, and uh, new residences for, for the population would be in Mestre. And that's kind of, uh, you know, it was by design at that point, that was the beginning of an of an exclusion of uh, the lower classes really from Venice before World War II. But then of course, the um, World War II created an influx of uh, people moving into Venice, considering it to be a safe city to be in. So that's where Venice really reached its peak population. People say up to 200,000 probably during the war, but the first census after the war was 170,000 and then after the war, 
what's really clear also from this book that I highly recommend, The Bonifica Humana by Clara Zanardi, after World War II, really there was an exodus from Venice, a voluntary exodus of people leaving Venice because of the unsanitary and really almost third world kind of uh, housing that was uh, uh, available in Venice. Super overcrowded, very low standards of hygiene, uh, very poor housing, really, and uh, people initially left uh, to go, for example, to Messer, but actually initially more likely to the Lido, which was developing at that time with new housing and just, you know, not, it wasn't even cheaper, really. It was more expensive at the time, but it was much, so much better that people moved out on their own in the, uh, in the first, um, you know, 20 or so years after World War II. But then at that point, you know, the, the, the city started to depopulate and, um, and people then began to move out because it was cheaper. So initially it was more expensive to move out of Venice, but you're moving to a better housing condition. But then by the mid seventies, uh, the housing actually uh, in Venice became more expensive and, and, you know, it got restored, things became, you know, more sanitary, uh, better, you know, homes were, you know, um, restored. But at that point, it became cheaper to actually move to other places like uh, the Lido still, but mostly uh, the mainland at that point. So that's when uh, uh, a big chunk of the exodus happened, really, uh, in the, the second um the, the last quarter of the uh of the uh, 20th century and then um from then on uh, basically the uh, the exodus uh has become more of a choice between housing and and jobs because um you know, the housing now is available i mean given the fact that we lost <laughs> so much of the population obviously there's housing uh the conditions are not so bad uh, the prices are not even super high, really, comparatively, you know, compared to other, um, you know, uh, cities in the world. Uh, but it's just that people can't live in Venice anymore because they can't find jobs that are suited to their um, skills. And uh, if they found the jobs suited to their skills, they could afford housing, probably, but it's just uh, mostly jobs. And I'll show you the data that we found to support that. So first of all, you know, as as we know, it's the population not only declining, but it's also aging. Uh, this, these two graphs here show, you know, from 2010 to the left and the 2020 on the right, you can see how, you know, the majority of the population is shifted pretty much uh, higher. Uh, so, you know, the 55 to 59 age range is the most populous range in Venice um, as of 2020. And the, you know, this is kind of like, an inexorable kind of uh, type of graphic because uh, whatever comes in at the bottom kind of gradually makes its way to the top and it's kind of like a snake you know uh, eating a rodent and the, the 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 rodent kind of makes its way up and the the negative thing to note here is that on the right uh, uh, graph um, the bottom is basically the births and you can see how much fewer births we've had in Venice in the you know the last you know compared to 2010, and so that's going to snake its way up gradually unless that gets replenished somehow. That's going to be what we end up with later on, you know, in the decades to come. So it's not looking good in that in that respect. Um, uh, this other graphic, which is also based on basically the same data shows uh, pretty much the difference in the, in the age cohorts in 2010, the pale and the more orangey bars are the 2020. And, you can, and the red bars are the, the difference. And you can see how the majority of the losses of population happen uh, in the working years in the 30 to 50 range. So that's, indicates that jobs have a lot to do um, with why people leave and uh, but but they actually we lose people at all ages but there's different reasons for it on the left the the, the first couple bars one is the the births basically fewer births but also parents 
uh, of you know newborn children moving out pretty quickly after the children are born before they go to school, probably because you know their jobs don't let afford them the uh, ability to buy a home for a family, and so they move maybe to the mainland for a cheaper home for their family. Uh, in the middle, you can start to see uh, students leaving Venice to go to school somewhere, probably college. Uh, the, the, la the right hand bar is the college years, kind of like, and that's when people kind of leave the city to go educate themselves. But also, we lose people in the retirement years, uh, oddly, when, you know, I guess people are done working uh, and living in Venice and maybe. This could be the people that are ex exasperated by the tourists that actually leave at the end of their career to go somewhere else for retirement. Interesting, you know, potential reasons for those graphics. This is another view of, again, kind of really the same data, but looking at the same age cohort 10 years later. And you can see how, you know, the college years bring students in to Venice. I mean, those are those age cohorts grow in in those uh, 20 to 35 years. But then uh, they leave <laughs> when it's time to work. And this is pretty steady uh, loss uh, every year in the, every every uh, five years. These are five year increments um, for people who just uh, are of working age and kind of leave the, the, the final bars where you see a lot of losses are partially because of retirement, people leaving for retirement, but also, you know, people dying basically in the last few bars is just a loss for people just to uh, old age. So back to uh, our smart desk project. So that's the kind of the premise of that in terms of what the population dynamics are showing. So what we did is we interviewed, uh, uh, we conducted over 215 interviews and are conducting focus groups now. And we looked at commuters commuting in and out of the city and students who uh, moved into the city to go to, to college in Venice. And also we looked at emigres, people who you know grew up in Venice and moved out and, and looked at the reasons for leaving in Sierra. Here's some of the results, which I think are pretty interesting. I mean, obviously we have a lot more than just this, but I'm gonna just show you this right now. <clears throat> so um, this is, you know, interviewing, um, people who migrated out of the city. The reasons why they first left, you can see in the green uh, piece of the pie there is for study primarily. Uh, some of them moved out because of the how housing situation. So housing is not totally out of the picture, but certainly they moved primarily out to study. This is the, the most recent past, right? In the last 20 years or so. Um, but when they finally got done with their studies, uh, they didn't return to Venice. And you can see the red bar here on the right because of work. So they stayed out primarily because of work. Uh, some of them stayed out because of choice. In all of this, there's a, 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 an ingredient of choice. Some people just you know, don't necessarily like to live in Venice. They prefer to live somewhere else. You know, not everybody, even if they're born in Venice, necessarily want to stay there. But, you know, a lot of them do want to stay because, as you see in this graphic, the green uh, slice there is how many people, uh, how many of these emigrants would like to return to Venice, and the majority do, and if you include the maybes, it's, you know, a, a big majority. But some people still don't want to return. I mean, they're fine where they are, they don't necessarily want to come back. But still, there is a desire for some a lot, a majority of the Venetians that moved out to come back. Um, and what would need to change for them to come back is in this bottom uh, graphic. Uh, basically, the majority would say that is that they would, what would have to change is more jobs or more and better jobs, the orange slice there. The second one certainly would be housing, so housing is not out of the picture. And, you know, only third is the people, you know, would like to see less tourism in the city in order to come back. Uh, and the greater ease uh, slice here in the, in the uh, teal color is basically kind of hides a, you know, uh, the sentiment that, you know, Venice is not an easy city to live in because there are no cars. It's not 
so it, ha it has a mobility kind of component there in the ease section. Uh, we also, as we interviewed people who commuted out of the city, we, we actually looked at, you know, what allowed these people and what kind of people were able to live in Venice, so they're residents of Venice, but they don't work in Venice. And the, none of them worked in tourism, as you can see from this graphic. So all the people that we interviewed who were commuting out of the city uh, were in professional kind of jobs, uh, either technical or education and so forth. Um, and and pretty much all of them commuted pretty close to Venice, like Mestre, Marghera, or Padova, the three big places to commute to, which uh, seems to you know suggest that perhaps uh, if um, the transportation system was faster and you could get to places outside of Venice in a shorter time than now perhaps more of more people would be able to live in Venice and and even though the Venice itself doesn't have the jobs that they that they studied for they uh, they may be able to still get a job close enough in time with a fast system that they could still be residents so that's a one way to repopulate the cities to make transportation faster to get people in and out uh, but certainly the types of jobs uh, are the biggest uh, obstacle to repopulating Venice. Basically, if you're not in the uh, tourism um, economy, then you have to go somewhere else. So that's the, um, the research part, just to frame the title of the project, which is on repopulation. And that's, you know, what we're still working on in with Smart Desk. And we have uh, a bunch of uh, focus groups coming up touching upon all of these uh, issues that we just talked about. And uh, let me just uh, do the focus groups real quick on the right hand side here, these circles. We're gonna have focus groups uh, with stakeholders from each one of these categories. So housing and commerce and workers and residents and mobility. So all these uh, will um, consist of uh, uh, a, a lengthy focus group, you know, preceded by interviews. Uh, some of you have been interviewed for this already. Uh, and then uh, out of these should come the policies that we could propose to ameliorate the, the situation in all these um, sectors. Okay, so that was the research. What else we do in, in uh, serendipity is uh, culture. We um, essentially because it is kind of a creative uh ecosystem we're trying to create we wanted to uh, make sure to include art and uh, and uh, culture in uh in what we do so we dedicated the entire ground floor and the church part and the bell towers and apses to um to art and performances and uh out of that came uh, um uh so first we started by uh hosting um um sorry first we started by hosting um apologies for that uh you know biennale type shows very cool and early the first year we were there we started the artist in residence program which continues to this day we have two rooms in the bell tower that are dedicated to artists in residence we had a variety of those uh we hosted a, a group of artists from the conservatory of venice called venice acoustic electroacoustic rendezvous verve uh and from that uh collaboration uh, mostly based on music we uh, join forces to create Cosmo, which is basically the culture branch of what we do at Serendipity. And Cosmo uh, it, it attempts to be not just a place for doing things, but a place to produce things. So it really is very active in collaborations on artistic uh, endeavors that are not just uh, displayed in our church, but are actually created in our church. And uh, we've done a, quite a, a lot of things. In that respect, uh, the very first uh, show that Cosmo had was a show by uh, Brian Eno, which I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, with an art uh, piece. But the movie, for example, by Andrea Segre, uh, Welcome Venice, that I'm sure some of you have seen, was shot, uh, all the interior 
uh, 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 scenes were shot inside our church. So all the uh, you know, the shots you see in that movie of uh, the home of the of the fishermen or the Airbnb are come coming from inside our church. And we just recently had Ralph Lemon, uh, famous choreographer. Uh, with a dance uh, piece uh, supported by Palazzo Grassi. And so it's kind of high-end um, um, artistic productions and they continue um, you know, every month or something. And I invite you to come come and see them. Uh, so they're very, um, very avant-garde and very uh, high-end uh, productions. So that's the culture part. And finally, the startup part is the, uh, the one to connects to the talk, which is our attempt to uh, repopulate, not only to study uh, and, and create an environment with culture, but to actually promote the creation of actually jobs in Venice uh, is a whole side of what we do at Serendipity. Uh, it starts with the fact that we, because of the 35 years of studies that we produced with the Venice Project Center, we generated a lot of ideas and a lot of prototypes of potential uh, viable startup companies. And that's how Serendipity kind of got started and how we got the space in uh, H3 factory in the Judeca, because we thought we were gonna actually produce these uh, startups on our own. And we kind of did that in part, uh, you know, by using our data and our and our technology, we created the first startup, which was DAB, DAB, uh, which is a, a transportation company having to do with mobility, and it's basically a trip planner and a ticket uh, purchase uh, ap application that uh, was launched in 2018 and uh, is active right now. It created jobs. It's become, it's become really the, the app for ATVO, the, uh, the bus company from uh, Eastern Veneto, that is really the main app for them. But we also work with uh, uh, ACTV and Ali Laguna in, in Venice who are selling tickets and providing trip planning. For, uh, so that's our one startup. From that, we realized that we can't create all our own startup, <laughs> learned a big lesson. Uh, and we decided that it would be uh, better uh, for us to kind of foster the creation of startups by other people, which is what we switched to. And to support that, we started by collaborating on the Climaton that happens every uh, every year in Venice. We have been uh, co-creating, co-supporting uh, the uh, Climaton Venice with uh, Venice Calls, uh, a local youth organization. So every year we have a uh, two-day hackathon basically on climate that could produce potential startups in in the, in the climate uh, world um, so that's going to happen again this year in early november in our space with venice calls uh, we also are part of a network now of uh, in, uh, let's call them uh, innovation centers uh, all throughout italy that uh, is called habitat um, and as you can see, Venice here is in yellow, so we, that's us, and so we are uh, one of the three main hubs of this, and that will also produce ideas for startups uh, through the uh, through the programs that are um, conducted in that um, that program. But most importantly, what we're um, doing uh, as of starting this year is uh, we brought MIT Design X to Venice. Uh, which is a collaboration with between Serendipity and uh, the MIT program uh, at the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT, which is where I uh, got my PhD. And so that's the connection there. So this is a program that is um, um, in Venice is basically a duplicate of the one that has happened in Boston for the past six years. And it's going to be in our uh, space in the H3 factory. And it's going to be taught by MIT faculty who are going to become be coming to Venice uh, to to support these teams that we select uh, every year. So we select ten startups and guide them through the process of becoming a viable uh, business. And here's the calendar. In general, this is a yearly thing. This is kind of based on the this year's calendar. We, there's a preparation phase and then the actual program. 
as you can tell from the dates, we have uh, we've already done the preparation phase for this year. We made a call for startups in uh, April, and we uh, look we're looking for ideas in four main categories: historic preservation, tourism of the future, environment essentially, and basically smart cities. Those are the four areas that we uh, wanted ideas uh, from. And we've uh, conducted uh, three uh, uh, events in May and June, two ideathons and an open day. And we had over 150 attendees uh, and a lot of interest from a lot of people. And all of this leading to the submission uh, of the ideas on July 17. Uh, through, you know, we had a portal for that and a big form to, for people to fill out. And basically, out of that, we uh, Oops, we got, uh, uh, sorry about that again. I keep clicking on the wrong thing. <clears throat> so we got 56 submissions, uh, 56 ideas, 50, 56 teams, uh, in, which included a, hundred, you know, a total of 183 applicants. And out of that, we took 10. So we basically had to discard basically uh, over 80% of the uh, submissions to take the 10 best ones who uh, um, were selected based on these factors. So basically we're looking for ideas that have a real uh, feasibility uh, and impact on society. And uh, I can actually, you know, produce jobs essentially and be financially uh, self-sufficient uh, and uh, uh, sustainable. So, and and so obviously look at the teams because that's probably the number one factor in in success for these things. Uh, so we did all that and selected the ten uh, startups for this year, uh, with a total of thirty five members. Uh, and here they are. So you know I'm not going to read you all the names. Uh, it just suffices to say that these ten uh, ten companies will. Uh, get a, a, um, a grant essentially from uh, Fondazione di Venezia of 4,000 euros each uh, uh, just to support their participation. Uh, you have pro provided uh, transportation and accommodation uh, coverage for the MIT faculty. And at the end, we also have prizes that we're going to give to the top three um, startups at the end of the program. Uh, they, they're fairly, you know, they covered all the four themes. We have one in conservation, uh, three in the tourism of the future, uh, five in the environment and energy and so forth, and, and one in the uh, sort of smart cities, smart tools. Uh, you may have seen some of these names before. Some of them are well known in Venice, like eConcepts, the one that makes the uh, the poles to recharge electric boats. Um, Airbnb is well known. Um, so these are all, um, you know, I could give you maybe later in the question and answer, I could give you explanations about them. But they're, you know, they're they were selected because they were good ideas, and we think they have a uh, potential to be successful. And so th these ten will actually start the program now uh, in a couple of weeks uh, the first workshop is uh, going to take place in uh, in our space in Judeca with MIT faculty uh, and it's a four-day boot camp very intensive for the uh, beginning of the of the program and then every couple of weeks there's a workshop with faculty coming back from MIT uh, all the way to the final pitch on the day before Thanksgiving actually <laughs> November 23rd uh, in Venice, you know, it's going to be on streaming as well, uh, will be the final presentations of their uh, pitch decks by the thing. And then the top three will get prizes. And, you know, Serendipity wants to incentivize their settling in Venice. So our goal for Serendipity is to, you know, try to make it as easy as possible for these companies to actually uh, settle their headquarters in Venice and to then create jobs in Venice because that's really the underlying goal of all of this. Uh, the curriculum is very rigorous. This has been tried and tested in Boston for uh, six years now. It consists of 60 modules, very structured, um, very sort of, uh, um, you know, super uh, uh, efficient and, and effective. And so at the end of all that, uh, we'll, we should see some real 
companies come out and you know, with the creation of real jobs. The faculty, like I said, are all from MIT. You know, I guess it includes myself, even though I'm a, a professor at WPI, but I'm on the faculty of Design X. And these are people who have done this for the past six years very successfully in Boston. We hope to emulate that success, and that's really what we are hoping for, because this is what happened in Boston in just six years. Uh, they, were, they created 60 startups and over 350 jobs, which for Venice would be an incredible result. But you know, we're not counting on exactly duplicating this, but uh, even if we um, succeed partially, Compared to this, I think that would be a great system because you know, in you know, in five years we'll have five, fifty startups, and uh, hopefully they can uh, have the same uh, success at at uh, attracting funding as uh, these have. Um, and so uh, we no, we will be in the, in this space until twenty twenty seven for sure because that's the length of our current um, agreement. Hopefully, it, we will be renewed at that point. We don't know. But until then, we're just gonna continue to do what we do, uh, which is what I just illustrated to you. Uh, but in just, you know, by 2027, uh, we will have 375 more WPA students come to Venice for 90 more research projects. That's a lot of potential uh, information to feed to our startups. Uh, the Smart Desk program will end in the meantime, but we will begin to bring MISTI students, which are MIT, students who will start coming next summer so that will be extra uh, support for our startups of course cosmo will continue to do its shows and productions uh and you know mit design x will produce uh certainly 50 startups uh you know potentially 150 jobs which would be a great start um, and the last thing that I want to just mention is that uh, one thing that we're going to be doing in 23-24 is, uh, and it's already, you know, in the works for the past couple of years, is to create a uh, venture fund for uh, Venetian startups, a 20 million euro fund that we've already done the due diligence for, and then we're now in the process of structuring as a real uh, fund with, uh, with the goal of uh, having this uh, be activated by the end of next year. So that's uh, what we do, what we like to do, and we, all of this is uh, with the, you know, for our mission to, which is to uh, repopulate, to help repopulate the city, uh, because that we think is probably the number one um, future challenge for our city. And you know, in, in addition to all the things that were mentioned by the other speakers before, certainly figuring out a way to create jobs that are not non-extractive and are not in the tourism industry would be one of the main ways to uh to get the population back up to uh to a level where tourism becomes you know more of a, a small nuisance and not an overwhelming presence in the city thank you very much and here's a few links if you want to see the things that i just mentioned Is anybody there? Okay. Yep. Hi. Hello. Hi, Fabio. This is Frederick. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just, well, thank you for your talk as well. So we've had, uh, so greetings again to everyone watching this. We've got people in many places. You can please jump back on the, uh, on the screen, all the, the presenters, um, and we can, uh, you can go to the next slide or go to a, the typical background slide. Um, hello. Um, so a couple quick things. We had some great comments in the, the chat. So please enter more questions there. I've been taking notes and we're ready to talk. One specific question for Melissa. We'll start with the smaller ones um, and then we'll go to some of the bigger questions. I've got questions for all of you. Uh, but one thing, a question, you, Melissa, you were talking about this, the blue smalt, the uh, beautiful blue that was made from glass that Veronese employed, uh, but it, it wasn't stable. Uh, and so we, hence the gray or brown skies in a bunch of his paintings. The question was, is the blue pigment in, uh, made of lapis, is that more stable? Yes, when you still have true blues in paintings, it's lapis or azurite, which are two, two pigments that do, they do alter, but not to the same degree that smalt does. They're more expensive pigments. Right, and uh, so and that, that's part of it. I mean, sometimes things that are built to last, you have to pay for it. 
Um, and then also someone made a good question when I was making the, uh, the point that the, generally the historically best known cities uh, in Italy are on the West Coast, not on the East Coast. Someone said, hey, what about Trieste? And um, actually for 550 years, Trieste was part of Austria. So not an Italian city, but fair point. And I'm sure if anyone that comes from Bari or um, Rimini or, or Ravenna, you know, they're all annoyed with me. But uh, it's interesting that one explanation maybe for the fact that the cities uh, on the Adriatic are less well known is that they were debated, don't, uh, dominated by Venice for you know many centuries. I mean, in lots of maps, the whole northern Adriatic is called Golfo di Venezia, so maybe you know kind of pushed away other cities. So, so um, some questions. Um, the basic one, which we hear all the time, anyone that loves Venice or claims any si kind of knowledge, people ask me, um, and I'll ask this at Davide. So, is Venice still sinking? And uh, or even if the, you, you talked about subsidence, does that count as sinking or is it really connected to the extraction of water? Could you just address that again? Yeah, I would say, well, the answer is that is yes, Venice is still sinking. It's uh, due to natural processes mostly at the moment. There is no anthropogenic subsidence, but uh, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, it is important that uh, the regulations that are enacted now remain enacted in the future because uh, there is a dramatic potential for water withdrawal to lead to sinking of uh, several centimeters or even tens of centimeters in a matter of uh, a decade or so. So definitely Venice is sinking. One millimeter per year is the current estimate, but it is quite variable. There is heterogeneity in the rates of uh, vertical land movements currently, which also depends on the weight that the different palaces, for example, or the different uh, construction operas, including the Mose, uh, um, impinge, so to say, on the on the ground. Great, thank you. That is helpful uh, to know. Um, and one question for Fabio, someone posted earlier in the chat. Are the various projects around the world using the label SER and DPD, are they interrelated? Because you certainly, I will say, you have a lot of uh, acronyms and logos on your slides. Uh, you're muted, Fabio. I don't know of another certain DPT that I know of. Uh, I mean, there are uh, organizations called Serendipity, which is the actual original word. But ours is an acronym also, Serenissima Development and Preservation Through Technology. So as far as I know, there are no others, but could be. Um, uh, so question again, uh, this one I'd like to ask, uh, let's start with Jane maybe. So one question about the viability of Venice as a place is something as basic as healthcare, right? United States has a lot of trouble with this. Italy's seen maybe is doing it better, but specifically how is it in Venice, either in Venice proper or, you know, the, the broader Venetian lagoon and the sort of amalgamated city of Venice. Would you talk about that? And I, all of us, I'm sure have had experiences with Venice healthcare and Venice hospital. So we can jump in, but start with you, Jane. Well, um, just as everywhere else in, in the world, you know, health, the one thing about Italy compared to the United States is that the public health system is very strong in Italy, but it's obviously not perfect. And with the collapse in the resident numbers in Venice, we're under constant um, threat that they'll close the civic hospital in Campo Santi Giovanni e Paolo, which was right off to the side of the slide that Melissa showed of where the kids were waiting for a boat to bring back their football. Um, and we do repeatedly have to protest, gather signatures. In fact, during the course of this um, symposium this afternoon, I must say, I did have one eye on my emails and, you know, there is an issue now with the number of um, general practitioner family doctors in Venice because there's the tension of the low population figures. So according to national or regional algorithms for health service coverage per person in the population, Venice might seem like it doesn't merit, you know, as many doctors or as big a hospital as it has. But we first of all have to take into consideration the daily population that's present in Venice, students, workers, tourists, etc. We all know 
um, some significant people have had their lives saved by the Venice Hospital, even though they were just on holiday. Um, Michael Hesseltine is one of them, but um, it's also the logistics of Venice make it necessary for a more dense health service in order to serve the living population. So I see that the person's qualified their question saying, you know, is, do people move out because of, I don't know if that's a question, is that, is he asking that people are moving out because they can't get enough health service? Um, I don't know, because there are some logistical complexities, but there's also amazing resilience in the local population. I know that the Knights of Malta that have an important, um, uh, what's it called, you know, premises in Venice, they let their, some of their rooms and their garden be used for rehabilitation for people who've had brain damage to save them the logistical nightmare of having to go to the big hospital on the mainland in Zellarino, which is part of Mestre, or to San Camillo, which is far at the Lido. So, you know, obviously all situations can't be generalized. Um, but I think in, in this case, I'd just like to pinpoint the vibrancy of the remaining community in Venice to find solutions, even though we'd prefer institutional long-term solutions. Thank you, Jane. That's excellent. Um, does anyone else have observations about healthcare in Italy or Venice and what this says about the city's viability? Or uh, you know, a, These are all parts of a puzzle. Anyone? Melissa? John, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Um, yes. The hospital in Venice is also a good example of a building of historic importance that has been reutilized and is the hospital. And so you can't, you see that this can coexist. The Scuola Grande di San Marco, or I could say Venice happened to restore the facade, but it's, um, it was a confraternity. It was turned into a hospital by Napoleon. It still is today and stood, should still remain. And we obviously need a hospital for tourists and for residents. And I think this is an outstanding example. You don't need to build something new. You can use the space that's already here and it can be a very kind of nice quali quality of hospital as well as far as outdoor spaces and, and visitors and, and views, of course. So there are positive aspects definitely about the healthcare system here and how it can survive in Venice. Venice was the avant-garde of the health system years ago. Right. So as we were reminded, everyone was reminded during the plague, I mean, again and again, uh, in our recent pandemic, right? People talked about the plague of 1576 in Venice, which brought uh, the construction of the Church of the Redentore, or the plague of 1630, which brought the construction of the Church of the Salute, and things like the idea of a sanitary pass, saying that you were free of disease. That was a Venetian thing. The idea of a quarantine, right? 40 days, 40-ish days. Um, so that's uh, those are sort of powerful lessons in history. And indeed, I think it's fair that just being in Venice, right, uh, or thinking about it makes one conscious of history in a way you don't get as much with a younger place. Um, uh, okay, so uh, questions. Do any of the, the four presenters have a question for each other or would like to build on something that someone said earlier with their slides? Okay, I, I do. I have a question for both David and Jane connected to the, uh, you know, to the fact that uh, even, uh, you know, even though the mosaic seems to be working right now, um, you know, at some point it's going to be closing so frequently. So question first to David is, um, what do you see as the ultimate solution to the issue of sea level rise? Is it going to be a Dutch solution where Venice is going to be, you know, f fenced off by, uh, you know, permanent earthen dikes of some sort with occasional passage of water to, you know, circulate in the lagoon or what's the, what's the future? Because I don't see people, you know, the humanity letting Venice go underwater. So what, would be the alternative, you know, a hundred years from now. Or what should well, we really start talking about right now? <laughs> well, I can only mention one of the alternative solutions that were screened uh, <clears throat> before the mosaic was chosen, and uh, it was about uh, um, pumping water back into the into the ground to rise Venice to counteract the effects of anthropogenic subsidence. Okay. 
So this is an approach that uh, has never been attempted, I think, elsewhere. And probably it's very expensive, technically challenging, but could be an option. I don't know actually which will be the ultimate solution. I think there is a lot of political decision involved. It's not uh, only a technical or economic uh, decision to be taken. The MOSE itself was mostly a political decision because the barriers had to disappear were not in use, right? Right. So, well, that was a superintendence requirement. Uh, but yeah. So, so I, you know, uh, Frederick remembers this, you know, I, 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 maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I made a presentation and, uh, you know, where I was trying to point out that it took us 50 years to create a temporary solution, which is the MOSE, because we know it's not final. And so the question is, maybe we should start talking talk about the, the real final solution now, because it might take us 100 years to come to, to a conclusion. And maybe it is a Dutch type solution, maybe not. Maybe it is pumping uh, water on the ground, but I think the main point should be like, let's start talking about it now, because if it took us 50 years to do the MOSE, it's gonna take us like much longer to do something even more drastic, probably, is my I can only well, I can only agree with you. Okay. Well, actually, my thesis was, first of all, I'd like to say that the idea of um, raising Venice, the one that Davide just referred to, um, is still a possibility and it's not like an either or with the flood barriers or raise venice we can raise venice and also rely on the, the barriers to protect venice from the extreme events but at least by that uh proposal made by some geotechnical engineers at the university of padua that we're still collaborating with actually only requires about two million euros for the next stage in the feasibility and which is crazy because two million euros is what you know they spend on a party during the venetian you know the, during the biennale vernissage and with that you know if if the people that come to the party left the same amount also for testing this idea it could be incredibly um significant for venice and as you say for humanity so let's not think that that idea has been lost it, it's something that needs to be explored as soon as possible um i i tried to make the point but i was saying a lot of things in my presentation so i couldn't linger and thank you for giving me a second chance is what what we um are trying to show uh first via direct intervention in the lagoon to show how we can optimize the recreation of salt marsh in the most cost effective and resilient way there's if you think about the fact that the lagoon currently just has one sixth of the salt marsh it used to have you know 500 years ago by putting more salt marsh into the lagoon you in, you increase the sponginess of the environment and that slows down the 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 flow of the water not during an extreme event like a storm surge but on the everyday you know chronic tides it can reduce the number of times that the mobile barriers need to be closed and i think that that can we're, we're still working on the numbers but i'm intending to be able to demonstrate before too long that venice can live with you know maybe 30 or 40 or 50 centimeters of sea level rise um, and so it's lagoon interventions as well as a, a better system than MOSE to protect it from the extreme events. Once we get beyond 30, 40, 50 centimeters of sea level rise, I'll, I'll leave the final word with David Day on this, but I really don't think that humanity at that point will be able to protect, to talk about saving Venice. You know, there's so many coastal cities around the world that will be seriously threatened at that point and other things will be happening with extreme events etc um the last thing we're going to need is to be worrying about the all the precious you know sadly and i hope we don't get to that but we i think that the the, the need to close the lagoon and completely change the ecology is is something that's beyond um the the lagoon resilience that we can save 
Is that clear? Uh, yeah, it was, it was just going to be my question to you, Jane, is like all these, you know, things you're doing to save the lagoon, what, what, how are those affected by the fact that they potentially will be closed up to two months a year, as Davide showed us? I mean, that's going to be a whole different environment to try to maintain, right, in some ways? Well, we don't we might not need to get to those two months of closure if, um, if the sponginess of the lagoon can be improved. And also, the, of course, there will be some changes, but they might be changes in the right direction for the lagoon compared to what's happening to the lagoon now, which is its marinization. Of course, you need to you know, take care of sediment loss, you need to take care of water quality because when the lagoon is closed more frequently or when the tidal exchange is less um, energetic like it is now, you can't have, you know, a lot of pollutants and things like that. Okay. Just, just to quickly add that uh, when we think about uh, sea level rise, it's not only implications for flooding and management of something like Mose. It's also that uh, increase in the mean sea level will change the transport through the different inlets, and this might change the circulation within the lagoon. Okay, so the area might be change their proneness to uh, host certain habitats. Okay, so we have really to understand better what happens when the sea level rises inside the lagoon beyond the flooding, if we want to preserve the environment and the lagoon ecotone. So I well, thank you both. Um, so these are not simple uh, solutions by any means. Uh, one thing I should also say that, uh, you know, you represent a big university, Davide, but on the whole, you know, Fabio with the DPT, Melissa with, say, Venice, Jane with We Are Here Venice, these are smallish organizations, right? We, we, we can't solve and certainly not fund uh, giant engineering works or similar things, but we can point people in the right direction. Uh, we can establish seed money, uh, make connections, bring awareness. Uh, you know, it's, it's, these are quite powerful uh, uh, ideas. I mean, you know, not everything in history has been done by big countries and huge corporations, uh, but rather by grassroots. Or, uh, you know, I'm trying to look at this with a you know glass half full attitude. Um, I wanted to mention one point, though, and we can go back then to discussion among the presenters, but someone had said, uh, Mike, who's making lots of comments and good comments in the chat, uh, he was noting um, just about the relation between maybe Venice and West Berlin during the period of the uh, you know, division of Germany, so you know, right after the Second World War until uh, around 1989, and the point there is that West Berlin was indeed heavily subsidized. Uh, businesses moved out, of course. Berlin went from being easily the most important city in Germany before the war to being you know, much smaller. Uh, uh, and companies relocated, uh, for example. And I remember talking to people in Berlin uh, in the 90s, so soon after the reunification, and they talked about how it was an odd place uh, during the, particularly by the 1970s or 80s, uh, that it was full of the very young students and the very old and no one in between. And that makes me worry. I was thinking of that point, actually, Fabio, when you're showing your various population graphs and uh, you know, not enough students or young people living permanently. And uh, it's an interesting idea that Mike's comment has then that, uh, I mean, in some ways, Venice is definitely subsidized, uh, right? Um, and it does have incredible economic levers in, of that huge amount of tourism. I mean, a lot of people care about Venice, um, like they care about you know, elephants and cheetahs and, you know, rare animals that are under threat, but will people change their behavior? So I'd like to ask, I'll talk a little bit about the special law for Venice, because that was very much in play when I first started coming to Venice, and now that's lapsed. Uh, um, what, Melissa, do you want to talk about that, or maybe Jane? Or um, I can certainly speak as on behalf of conservation efforts. There were, the special law for Venice has various levels uh, it did provide some money for um, for restoration conservation to the local branch of the Ministry of Culture, and much of that has been limited because there are other issues uh, that have to be addressed. But I can say recently that the, the uh, National Ministry of Culture just made a series of very large grants once again, and um, 1.6 million euros being given to the ghetto, which will accompany part of our project we're doing in the Italian synagogue, they're dedicating to the German synagogue. So we're seeing a little bit of movement as far as, as culture goes. Um, 
but certainly the special laws of Venice um, have their ups and downs and probably the others can speak more about their areas and how that affects. I'd like to hear about the, 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 the member various national money for, for conservation or infrastructure also. I think it was the Comune, the city of Venice had something about mortgage, letting people of a certain, under a certain age buy mortgages uh, yeah. uh, for apartments. Can you talk about those? Well, um, there's an Italian expression that says fra dire e fare c'è di mezzo il mare. So between saying and doing, there's the sea in between. And the fact that Venice <laughs> is a lagoon which in in a way is an extension of the sea um, speaks to that motto and that there were three iterations of the special law if if you just go and read the specifications in those laws it has they have everything written in them to make venice a, to set the the rules so to speak for perfect governance and administration and money flows to Venice, the way that those special laws have been implemented over the years has been um, uh, rocky. <laughs> um, it's very difficult for Venice to be administered. Prime, the main money flows for looking after Venice do come, are assigned by the central government in Rome. And Italy is full of cultural heritage, environmental challenges. So the attention that Venice gets from Rome is never enough. And this is made, this is only exacerbated by the governance question at the local level that I explained due to the population um, imbalance between the historic city and the mainland, which means that the people running Venice, the people elected to run Venice can't justify spending more than a third of their time in line with the size of the population of Venice compared to the mainland, looking at these complexities and in turn advocating for Venice with, in terms of the money allocation through the special law from Rome to Venice. So the money from the special law goes partly to the municipality, the comune, it goes partly to the regional administration it goes partly to the universities, some of um, some for extra research, you know, for necessary research on to support the so-called decision making. But for a very long time, up until 2014, definitely, and since then to an extent, the, the way that money was spent was very uh, dominated by the whole lobby associated with the mobile barriers. And that starved the housing specifications of the, of the special law. That doesn't say that Venice needs to rely on the special law money. Our lagoon work is getting into very interesting territory in terms of public-private partnerships, corporate social responsibility, ESG investment, all these things, you know, the, the salt mass, we forgot to say, is incredibly potent at storing carbon dioxide, soaking it up and storing it. It's even better than any kind of a terrestrial forest, better than the Amazon, even up to 40 times better. So the lagoon could, in fact, isn't just to think about as, you know, the victim of climate change, the lagoon could help mitigate the effects of climate change with more salt marsh and more um, removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this can be funded, doesn't need government funding. It can be funded by businesses that need to counterbalance their environmental effects or often referred to as offsets. And regarding the housing, there's a lot of talk about ways of capturing more of the revenues from tourism flows through the city and this can be used to make the city more habitable by by the residents and not just go to the tourist companies along those lines i would like to point out that two of the um, uh, 10 startups that we're uh, going to be coaching through the mit design x uh, program starting in a couple of weeks 
uh, two of them. Uh, one of them is called C the Change, S E A the Change, which is uh, a carbon uh, uh, credit kind of uh, compensation for visitors of uh, seaside resorts. So that's why we thought that was kind of interesting and maybe it's applicable to the lagoon. And then we have a uh, fair BNB experience, which is, uh, as you know, uh, probably it's a, an alternative to Airbnb where money that is paid by tourists doesn't just go to the host uh, uh, person, but also a portion of the, of the, uh, um, of the proceedings go to uh, a local uh, project uh, suggested by the community. So that's, you know, I think those are, you know, ways, you know, to do a different type of tourism in the future in Venice that could also, you know, capture some of what you were saying, Jane, in terms of like um, figuring out how to uh, get tourists to compensate, you know, uh, by, you know, creating more marshes to sequester more carbon in, in, uh, in Venice itself. That would be a great virtuous cycle, I think. We'll see what comes of it. So on that, um, I want to think about comparatives, okay? Um, maybe we start with Davide and then we can move out, you know, from the science to the activism or the uh, technology questions. But we had a really good question posed in the chat by Stephen, uh, who said, do any other challenged maritime or canal cities, you know, like in Amsterdam or Bruges or a um, place, uh, provide positive or negative directions for Venetian decisions? So, you know, the Thames barrier in London or something. What would, start with David, are, are there certain things that Venice should try to be doing and certain things they shouldn't, should be trying not to do uh, when you compare to what's been, what's been successful or not successful in other you know, port cities around the world? Yeah, well, I think uh, <clears throat> the case of London is a good uh, example. I think uh, Venice should kind of draw from the experience and the approach followed in London. And uh, at least a discussion what, what, would you talk to just tell tell people on this on this Zoom a little bit about the the London example? Well, I don't know much about it actually, and maybe Jane has a different opinion and would like to speak more about it. So I leave. I don't know, David. Were you re referring to the Thames Barrier in London? Yeah, no. The Thames Barrier is a brilliant example because they're they're not when they before they even finish the. The building the first Thames barrier, which has worked incredibly well within the predicted costs, etc. Um, they they already started planning the next generation and the next generation after after that, and they also planned it in a way that it could take into it could incorporate unforeseen uses. So they didn't just use the the they aren't just using the Thames barrier to regulate flooding coming in from the sea, but they're also using it to control upstream flooding. The thing that I don't want to mimic in, in London is their kind of blinkered view, because they're at the same time as having this brilliant flood barrier that they, they're not seeing the limitations of the infrastructure in preventing flooding. And they continue to build these, you know, incredibly costly not just in investment terms but also for the environment these huge skyscrapers in the floodplain of the Thames so they're not really thinking about the risks but engineering wise it's wonderful what what London is is doing and I just want to quickly say while I've got <laughs> the mic on my um is that when we started our collaboration with Bangladesh I think this is something really interesting maybe to end on is that we um had a it was back in early 2021 i think when everything was still very much zoom based and we had a meeting with the main research institute in bangladesh and we thought we were all ready to tell them about the flood the, the flood warning system that the comune has the the centro mare and thought that they'd be interested in that and as soon as they started talking, we realized that, in fact, Bangladesh is way ahead in, of Venice in terms of their capacity to predict flooding. And, in, and the information flow is now coming in the other direction. We have a lot to learn from them. And um, the important thing is that Venice 
um, returns to it, its role in as it had in history, you know, in exchange and, and trade and openness to the rest of the world. Yeah, well, I certainly support that. I mean, a, a place of uh, exchange, a gathering, uh, one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world, you know, in the 1500s and now today. Uh, anything else to add, though, about, about things we don't want to do or do want to do? Do you have any thoughts, Fabio, compared to other port cities or islands? It's hard to compare. I don't know about islands, but I think, you know, I'm thinking of the eight uh, case study cities that are part of the uh, Horizon project that we're in, a smart desk project. You know, they're all, they're all real cities. I mean, Amsterdam, Lisbon, Barcelona. Yeah, they have issues with tourism, but uh, they're not dominated by tourism. I really think that the future of Venice will be predicated primarily on the ability of the administrations and uh, you know all of us really to uh, figure out a way to uh, attract and retain new residents. So, you know, like both people who, people who are born in Venice who go study abroad and have nothing to come back to and also people from abroad like all of you who are listening who are probably lovers of Venice who love to move to Venice but would be hard pressed to find a, a job that is not like an individual type job you know you could always do a job that's based on yourself anywhere pretty much but to create jobs for other people requires a different kind of approach and that does require eventually some uh, you know input from the administration because for example you know, parking and uh, mobility are big issues for uh, for businesses in Venice, like the ones we're trying to start, because people find it very inconvenient to come to Venice. And, you know, between the parking and the, the new rise of uh, the cost of tickets for outsiders, you know, just to come to the Judeca for somebody who comes to visit us would be 20 euros round trip with the new fares. I mean, just just to come to come across the canal and back, you know, because it's going to be nine fifty per uh, per trip, like you know, coming. I think September first, I believe. So I mean, if anything, things are going against that because the uh, the city is always thinking about tourists and way to extract money from them, and they don't think of the the what is needed in order to make Venice a really truly viable city where people actually could live and make money and like the old days that's why venice repopulated after the plagues is because you could make money in venice and people would, would you know wanted to move back to venice because that was the place to be and i don't think it's the case right now i think we need to do something really fairly drastic about that or gradual like we're doing you know where it might take 20 years for what you know well, jane doing. yeah one thing <laughs> One thing that I have to say that that some other city port cities are doing that we don't hear them saying in Venice is limiting the cruise ships. Um, Key West, Palma di Mallorca, many places in the world are now trying to set a limit on cruise ships because you know that's not the only type of tourism that that can can be welcomed to the cities. In fact, it can be quite a deterrent for other types of tourism. And um, I point. think Venice needs to really um, assess its role as a global leader and, and set a standard for, cruise, for the cruise industry throughout the world, rather than being a victim to it. Uh, uh, I would, have to say, I would have to say that, you know, cruise ships are, are very mediatic uh, kind of, uh, you know, images that you can project around the world. But in the bigger scheme of things, the two or one and a half or two million people that the cruise ships brought, even at their peak to Venice, were, you know, a drop in the ocean compared to people, for example, coming by train. Or well, you don't measure you don't measure tourism just in the number of people. You measure it in its consequences for air pollution. You measure it in the consequences for oh, the I lagoon agree. erosion. You measure yeah, it in the congestion. You look at what they do in the city, and there's definitely a difference between two million people coming in groups of a hundred and thousands at a time Indeed. and people coming with backpacks. No, I agreed. And, and that's a fact. And the fact that they dump uh, thousands of tens of thousands of people simultaneously on the weekends was a, definitely a problem. 
uh, I think Venice's uh, problems are, you know, you know, well beyond that. I think uh, uh, it's truly a matter of survival uh, as a, uh, you know, Venice, you know, you've heard the, 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 the moniker Venice Inc., right, from Gore Vidal and, and the likes, you know, Venice was a, a, you know, an enterprise in the old days. It was a proto-capitalist uh, society that had commerce at its center and was capable of, you know, doing great things with it. We just lost that completely. We became completely extractive, which is all about, you know, and we argue about tourism a lot, which is worth arguing about, but we're not really arguing as strongly about like reproducing the, the, um, the context for, you know, upon which a viable city economy can be built. And they kind of, we can argue against a lot of things, but I think let's start talking about like the, full solution for the flooding and the sea level rise what will it take 100 years from now to stop that forever and what would that mean for venice and how would we have enough population in venice to have a voice in all this because i think that's you know in the longer term the biggest challenge to venice i think you know tourism will be always part i think of venice but you know we can definitely make it a lot better and definitely reduce all the negative impacts, but it's really the disproportionate uh, size of of, of, of of tourist crowds versus local population that is a problem. We have more tourists in Venice than residents on any given day, and that's a problem. I mean, one way is to raise the tour, the, the residents population. That's what we're at. No, I, I think we'd all agree on that. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I, I think we would, Fabio, on that. And I think uh, you and Jane have mentioned this several times about the population question, both politically and economically, et cetera. Just to ask, so f to, before we conclude, a sort of flash poll, I'll is ask each one of you, um, uh, what do you think about proposals which have been enacted, you know, been approved but not actually enacted about charging an admission fee or uh, some other way of regulating numbers with a cost. So Davide, what do you think about these? Well, it's, I think it is an easy way to approach the problem. I think uh, education would always be the solution. So I think uh, that would make a much better and longer lasting effect. Melissa? Uh, I think it's a very, something very difficult to put into effect how you control it. It's going to be difficult for people that have to work here coming in and out of the city. There have to be just more regulations before people even arrive um, to stop the, the, the tourism. I, I, don't, I don't have clear solutions from living here every day, working here, um, how, how, we can, how we can limit it even though it has to be done. Jane? Well, I think that it's nonsense to talk of the, the ticket, which is, what has been proposed without thinking of the, the kind of capacity, the maximum capacity of Venice to hold, you know, people and the congestion and the danger that people are in when the, on those days when Venice is extremely crowded. So um, maybe they will have to regulate how people, how many, they need to regu regulate how many people come to Venice. It's not a question of selling tickets even when you go to the movies they don't keep selling tickets once the auditorium is full and i must say yeah so i think they just need to and also um one of the most intelligent things i've had on the subject which um connects to what fabio says about the importance for imp increasing the number of residents is like to never let the number of tourists in the city go beyond the number of residents in the city. So if the, if the policies can help to increase the number of people living and working in Venice, that in turn increases Venice's capacity to host visitors. And if you think about it, when you go to Paris, the first thing I want to do is sit at a table in a, in a French restaurant and eat snails like the French people are doing. But the, the tourism pressure in Venice bends us in the direction of having to eat like funny bubbly soft drinks that the tourists want there's this stuff in the city now called bubble tea i hope nobody's tasted it i did and it was awful so uh fabio do you have a thought on the admission charge 
Definitely do. I mean, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I think we're the one team that actually looked at exactly what Jane was, uh, was saying. We looked at Venice as a safety issue. Like um, uh, we looked at the evacuation of um, stadiums as the, uh, I'll show you a quick slide here. <clears throat> we looked at that. We compared the, the, area between Rialto and San Marco to a stadium and there are specific rules to how many people can fit in a stadium and evacuate in a in a rapid time in case of a, an emergency and based on that we you know this is like uh, the exits here are bridges right and we knew all the size of the bridges and we calculated that the, and the total you know capacity was like around 30,000 for the whole city of Venice. So, you know, this is in case something happens and people have to flee. And this is probably a most defendable way to set a number. The fact is that Venice is physically restrained. <laughs> there is only so many people you can fit in Venice. We have the historic graphs that I just showed you earlier, right? We know what the maximum capacity historically has been. And that's when people were crowded five people to a room, right? So now I think at the most, you could probably fit 100,000 people in Venice safely, you know, in general. And if you, you know, calculate that 50% are, are uh, residents, like 50,000, and the fact that we have uh, almost 50,000 uh, hotel beds between hotels and Airbnbs, we have almost 50,000. We already have enough uh, to fill the whole city just with people coming overnight. And then that leaves no room for uh, day trippers, pretty much, if we wanted to limit it to a reasonable number. Even if we set it at 50,000 right now, no more uh, tourists than, uh, than residents, 50,000, again, is the, uh, is the capacity that we already have in our uh, you know, tourist accommodations. So I think one way to uh, restrict the number of, uh, of day trippers to make the price of entry such that it's more convenient to stay overnight. So instead of actually saying 10, 10 euros to come in and it's just a extraction fee, I'll make it 50 euros because 50 euros is more or less what you can you know spend to spend the night. And that's a better tourist. Tourists that stay overnight are better tourists in general. So I would try to make the, uh, the pricing dynamic and actually make, uh, you know, incentivize the overnight stays versus the day tripping which are the uh, the biggest kind of uncontrollable really um, you know numbers and keep in mind that the number one tourists in venice are italians right and the number one of those are from the veneto <laughs> so people come in like from pretty close by you know on weekends to venice in larger numbers than we you know than the than cruise ships or all of those other uh, contributions combined so I think there's a way to do this. And the fact is we have to limit it. There is no way we can't limit it. I well, think. okay. I mean, yeah. that, that's, uh, I think we all, that we all agree on, on that as a, as a real challenge, hard to know how you limit it. Right. You know, well, I very mean, hard, very hard to figure out who's coming for business. Who's yeah. coming just for the or, day. Or, or, yeah. Or, or exactly. <laughs> but, but I mean, for, but for example, you know, I've invested lots of money in Venice and its history and its culture. And I think I do a lot for Venice, but, if my you know 60th trip versus someone who has never been and this is her one chance, do I actually have a better say? Maybe not. It's an interesting thing to think about. Um, I am encouraged though by this conversation. First, we're all passionate about the city and pro solving problems and working together. It's also clear more now than I've felt before um, uh, just how linked small uh, issues are and big issues. And you reminded us that uh, of that, Fabio, with your point about um, you know yes, reminder that. Most Italians, most of the tourists in, in Venice are Italians, right? And they're people who come for the day. I mean, the day tripper in a way is a low, is a, is a, it's people in that country. Yeah. Yeah, but, but also how much these things are linked and how information is crucially important. Uh, and I also want to commend the people on the, uh, on the chat. Very good comments again and again, uh, and good questions. Uh, it's uh, very encouraging. I think we're all, I mean, uh, glass half full people we wouldn't be here if we didn't believe in venice's future the future of the human race and important things but it, it's been a real pleasure to be part of this uh and i thank all of you for your comments and i encourage people uh please to come and uh, if you're anywhere near the fenimore museum anywhere near cooperstown uh please make the trip and and be inspired as that exhibition inspired me so hello danielle 
Thank you so much, Frederick. Again, thank you to all of you out there for joining us. And a very heartfelt thanks to Frederick Ilchman, Melissa Kahn, Jane Damosto, Davide Zanketin, excuse me, <laughs> Davide Zanketin, and Fabio Carrera for teaching us so much and for being so incredibly generous with their time. Finally, our most sincere thanks to the MFA Boston and Art Bridges for their partnership and support. Benamore Art Museum's exhibition, Unmasking Venice American Artists and the City of Water closes on September 5th. Please come visit us in Cooperstown, New York to see it and to enjoy our extraordinary collections. Take care and we hope to see you in person soon. Grazie e arrivederci. Arrivederci. Come ciao, ciao. visit us in <laughs> Okay. <laughs> It does. Alla prossima, sì. Okay. Alla prossima. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.